At just 26 years old, Alexander was the most powerful man in the world. He had led his men from Macedonia to the edges of the Persian Empire, conquering cities and crushing armies. With the death of Darius, the campaign seemed to be at its conclusion, save for some minor mopping up operations. Alexander had fulfilled his promise to the League of Corinth of getting revenge for the Persian Wars more than a century ago, ending the Achaemenid dynasty and conquering the once great Persian Empire. It was a turning point in his life, and biographers of Alexander often draw a distinction between the first half of his campaigns, ending with the death of Darius, and the subsequent second half. This period of Alexander's life contains some of his greatest, most brilliant military achievements, but also some of his most brutal and bloody actions. Cracks began to develop in Alexander's ranks, due in part to Alexander's claims of divinity, and also to his growing adoption of Eastern customs. While previously Alexander and his men seemed to be entirely united, assassination, murder, conspiracy, mutiny and betrayal now started to become more and more regular occurrences. When the army had previously fought one clear enemy that could be defeated in pitched battles, they would now have to contend with guerrilla fighters and more nebulous foes that could not be so easily defeated in one battle. Yet despite all this, the army continued, driven on by the relentless ambition and audacity of their young king a seemingly unstoppable force that would change the course of human history. It wasn't the last time an army would alter history so radically and in the future the weapons of war would be far more powerful. To become a modern Alexander, you'll need to master the military vehicles of the modern age, and where better to start than our sponsor, War Thunder. This game lets you pilot military machinery from the 1920s to today in intense PvP combat. There are over 2,000 vehicles to pick from on land, sea and in the air, fighting together in combined arms clashes. Piloting all vehicles is easy, even with keyboard and mouse thanks to the special mouse aim mode. But visually the realism and detail is all there, with absolutely accurate models for all vehicles and you'll enjoy the beautiful audio-visual 4K masterpiece that comes with every epic battle. Join the fight now on PC, PS5 or Xbox Series X and S, or on older generation consoles, but make sure to do it via our link below to get a large bonus pack that unlocks premium vehicles, boosters, discounts and free premium account time, available to new players and those who haven't played for at least 6 months. It comes with an exclusive 3D decorator for your vehicles, but it's only available for a limited time. Hit the link in the description. Following the pursuit and death of Darius, Alexander rested his men for a time at Hecatompylos. With the aims of the League of Corinth fulfilled, Alexander dismissed the majority of his forces from the Greek city-states, approximately 600 cavalry and 7,000 infantry. They were all paid handsomely, and those that requested to remain as mercenaries were rewarded even more generously. Alexander's numbers were soon further supplemented by 300 cavalry and 2,600 infantry reinforcements from Lydia, and 3,000 sent by Antipater. His army, including the reinforcements that had arrived the previous year at Babylon, now numbered something in the ballpark of 30,000 heavy infantry, 7,000 light infantry and missile troops, and 6,500 cavalry, a total of 43,500. The departure of the Greek forces, however, encouraged the Macedonian contingents to think that they would also be returning home, and many even began making preparations for the journey. Alexander, though, had already begun planning to take his army further east than any Hellene had gone before and made an impassioned speech to his men. He pointed out that although they had successfully conquered much of the Persian Empire, the subjects had still not been subdued and that there were many other nations who would threaten their gains if they turned back now. In Alexander's view, we must either give up what we have taken, or we must seize what we do not yet hold. It would not be the last time that Alexander would have to make such a speech in order to convince his army to continue fighting. Nevertheless, Alexander's words, alongside even more generous payments to his soldiers, ensured their loyalties. Around this same time, Alexander also introduced a number of reforms to the army. The Companions and Phalangites had previously been composed on a geographical basis, with each unit consisting of men from the same area. Alexander did not break up the existing units, but he spread the new reinforcements throughout his ranks, laying the basis for eventually abandoning the practice and bringing in recruits from across the empire. 
Moreover, the companions and infantry units, while still retaining their battalion-level organization, were all broken up into small subsections. Officers for these were picked from the ranks based on merit and previous performance in battle, not dissimilar from modern NCOs. Overall command of these battalions was still retained by Alexander's tried and tested generals, such as Antigonus, Craterus, and Coenus, but these small subdivisions made it possible for Alexander's army to be more flexible and precise in its operations, attributes that would be crucial in the years to come. With Bessus having fled to Bactria, Alexander began a slow pursuit, aiming to subjugate the remaining Persian provinces en route, starting with Hyrcania. Here, Alexander had to contend with various mountain tribes that had yet to be fully subdued by the Persians, and fought a number of skirmishes with them. On one occasion, according to Plutarch, Diodorus, and Rufus, one of these tribes managed to seize Alexander's beloved horse, Bucephalus. Furious, Alexander ordered his army to destroy all the trees in the area, and threatened to eradicate the tribe entirely unless Bucephalus was returned to him. The tribe, terrified by the destruction of their land and the threats of massacre, quickly returned Bucephalus along with other tributes. Soon after this event, Alexander was met by a group of Persian nobles, including Nabazanes, the satrap of Hyrcania, and one of Bessus's co-conspirators. Bessus's coup had been hastily carried out, and since he had retreated towards Bactria, Hyrcania had been left almost deserted, with Alexander's army on their doorstep. Nabazanes saw the writing on the wall and surrendered. The remaining Greek mercenaries under Patron, that had served Darius, had also fled to Hyrcania, and they too sent envoys to Alexander, offering terms of surrender, an offer which Alexander accepted, adding another 1,500 to his army. As part of Nebazanes' surrender, he also gave a number of gifts to Alexander, one of which was a young eunuch called Bagoes. Bagoes, we are told, had previously been a favorite of Darius's, and would later become a favorite and lover of Alexander. Such relationships were by no means rare among Macedonian kings, as Archelaus I and Philip II both also had younger male lovers. It is likely that Nabazanes was aware of this, and gifted Bagoas to Alexander with instructions that the eunuch would endear himself to the king, in order to make the surrender as smooth as possible. If this was the intent, then it was successful, as Nabazanes was indeed spared. Alexander next subjugated the Mardians, defeating an army of 8,000 of them in the process. The Mardians were renowned horsemen, and Alexander took many of their horses as tribute to replace the thousands that had so far been lost. Though the campaign was progressing well, Alexander's growing Persianization was starting to become a problem. He had taken to wearing elements of Persian dress, including the Persian royal diadem, accepted Asians into his court, gave Persian cloaks to his companions to wear, indulged more and more in Persian luxuries, and even ordered that 30,000 Persian boys be taught Greek and the Macedonian style of fighting. For the ancient authors, this Persianization was a source of serious criticism against Alexander, and even during Alexander's lifetime, it was divisive. Some of his officers, namely his childhood friends like Hephaestion and Ptolemy, were welcoming of blending Persian and Hellenic cultures, but the older officers in Alexander's army, who had served under Philip, such as Parmenion, his son Philotus, and Cletus the Black, were more critical. It would prove to be a dangerous divide. Following his conquests of Hyrcania and Mardia, Alexander pushed further east towards Bactria. The Parthian satrap quickly submitted to Alexander, as did the satrap of Aria, Satipazanes. Shortly after Alexander had left Aria, though, Satipazanes killed the Macedonian garrison stationed there and tried to incite a revolt, forcing Alexander to quickly double back to protect his rear. Just two days after the revolt began, Alexander had arrived on the scene. Satipazanes himself managed to escape to Bactria with 2,000 cavalry, but the troops he left behind were quickly surrounded by Alexander and killed. Alexander pushed on taking Drangiana and preparing to spend the winter there. It was at this point that the division between Philip's older officers and Alexander's first became a major problem in a series of events well known as the Philotus Affair. One of the royal pages, Dimnus, planned a conspiracy to assassinate Alexander, 
Amongst those involved were Demetrius, one of Alexander's seven personal bodyguards, and Nicomachus, Dimnus's lover. Nicomachus in turn told his brother Cabalinus about the plot, who immediately took the information to Philetus, the commander of Alexander's companions. Philetus's brother Nicanor, who had been the commander of the Hypaspists, had recently died of an illness, and his grief may have affected his decision, but for whatever reason, Philetus decided not to inform Alexander. Frustrated, Cebalinus instead went to a different officer, who arranged for an audience between Alexander and Cebalinus, who told him about the plot. Alexander immediately sent soldiers to round up the conspirators, Dimnus killing himself before he could be captured, but the others being taken alive. Philotas was also seized. Philotas defended himself, saying that he had genuinely believed it to be just gossip, but also recognized that he had been mistaken. Alexander initially accepted this and forgave Philotas, but later consulted his most trusted officers about the matter. Though Philotas was a talented cavalry commander, he was not particularly popular with many of his peers, who often considered him arrogant and obnoxious, and were jealous of his powerful position. They all turned on him, convincing Alexander that Philotas must be put on trial, and also suggesting that if Philotas was involved, his father Parmenion likely was as well. The following day, Philotas, and by extension Parmenion, was put on trial for treason. Philotas defended himself well, pointing out that neither Dimnus nor Nicomachus had ever implicated him, and that there was no evidence against him, that when Cebalinus approached him about the plot, he made no attempt to silence him, and that he had no real motive, again insisting that he only made an admittedly bad mistake. Nevertheless, it was clear that his fate had effectively already been decided. In the council following the trial, Craterus, Hephaestion and Coenus convinced Alexander and the other officers that Philotas should be tortured for more information. Craterus, Hephaestion and Coenus had all fought alongside Philotas for years, and Coenus was even his brother-in-law. Nevertheless, it was these three that personally oversaw the torture, some sources also claiming that Alexander listened to the torture from the other side of a curtain. After many hours of brutal torture, Philotas eventually confessed to having been involved in the plot, also naming his father Parmenion as a conspirator. All the named conspirators, including Philotas, were executed, and two of Alexander's companions, Cleander and Sitilkes, were sent to race back to Ecbatana to kill Parmenion. When they arrived, they handed a letter to Parmenion, citing his son's crimes before assassinating him. Hearing of the popular general's death, the soldiers at Ecbatana almost immediately erupted into protest until Cleander and Sitocles read out the letter detailing the crimes of Philotas. Even despite this, the soldiers demanded that Parmenion be given a funeral with full military honours, a request that Alexander allowed. The obvious question is, was there any truth in the accusation that Philotas was involved? The most probable scenarios are that Philotas either allowed the plot to happen but was not involved in the planning, or that he genuinely thought that the conspiracy was not a serious threat and made a fatal error in judgment by not informing Alexander. Either way, the affair gave Alexander and his officers the perfect opportunity to clean the house. Parmenion had been one of the most experienced, talented and popular officers under Alexander's command and was crucial to the victories at Issus and Gorgomela. Similarly, Philotas had played an important role in Alexander's victories at Thebes, Miletus, and notably at the Persian Gates just months earlier. Nevertheless, they were both part of the Old Guard, having served under Philip. Both had criticized Alexander, Philotas even supposedly boasting in the past that he and his father deserved more of the credit than Alexander. Both were in incredibly powerful positions within the Macedonian army, and Alexander may have thought it too dangerous to have them in such grand positions without being able to entirely trust them. Alexander's officers had their own motivations. In the case of Coenus in particular, it appears likely that, because of his relation by marriage to Philotas, he was quick to distance himself from any accusations of also being involved, being one of the first to condemn his brother-in-law. The other officers were all ambitious men, and Philotas and Parmenion were both barriers to their careers. The two dead men would not, however, be directly replaced. 
Rather than risk having one man having command of such a large portion of the army, Alexander instead seems to have preferred to split their powers between numerous other officers, command of the companions being split between Cletus the Black and Hephaestion, merging the old guard with the new. Demetrius, the executed bodyguard of Alexander, was replaced with Ptolemy Lagus, the later founder of the Egyptian Ptolemaic dynasty. The Philotas affair and subsequent reorganization had cost Alexander precious time, and so, despite it being winter, Alexander left Trangiana, determined to cross the Hindu Kush and catch Bessus. The satrap of Arya was once again stirred up to revolt by Seti Pisanes, who had entered the province with 2,000 cavalry. However, this time Alexander would suffer no delays, pushing onwards and sending Eregeus, one of his close friends, to put down the revolt, which he did after a difficult battle in which Satipazanes was killed by Eregeus personally. Alexander quickly subdued Aracosia, founding a city in the area in the process, before reaching the Hindu Kush, probably sometime in April 329. The two-week-long crossing of the mountains was difficult. Alexander and his men trudging through deep mountain snow. Many of his men suffered from frostbite, some went snow blind, while others simply perished from the cold. Alexander, however, had chosen to take this particularly dangerous route into Bactria, specifically because it would outflank Bessus in Ionus. This plan worked. Bessus, alarmed by Alexander's rapid advance, abandoned the province, taking what army he could and crossing the Oxus into Sogdiana destroying any resources he could in the process to try and slow the Macedonians. Alexander quickly set about subduing the area, easily storming and taking the major cities of Bactria. In June, before leaving for the river Oxus, Alexander dismissed those who were either too old or whose time of service had been completed, rewarding them handsomely. Among them were the remnants of the famed Thessalian cavalry, the crack cavalry force that had been so crucial to Alexander's victories at the Granicus, Isis, and Gorgomela. Some of these men had returned home the previous year, some had died, leaving only a small number that had stayed on as mercenaries. These two were now dismissed with good pay. He and his army then set off, marching across the waterless and burning desert. It was a long march and cost Alexander even more men to dehydration. When they finally did find water, many of his soldiers, drinking too quickly, choked and died. Their troubles continued when they reached the Oxus itself. Bessus had made sure to burn the boats he had used to cross the river, and the area had no timber Alexander could use for constructing other boats or bridges. Undeterred, Alexander ordered his men to cross the river, creating rafts by using skins that the soldiers used for their tents, filling them with straw and sewing them shut. This move proved the final straw for Bessus's faction. Just as Bessus had done to Darius, Bessus's nobles, led in part by a man called Spitamenes, turned on him, keeping him under guard and sending word to Alexander, informing him of events. Alexander quickly sent a force of 4,000 infantry and 1,600 cavalry, possibly under Ptolemy's command, to seize Bessus. When Bessus was captured, he was, on Alexander's orders, flogged, stripped naked, and bound in a wooden collar. Alexander handed Bessus to Darius III's brother, who had his ears and nose cut off, a traditional Persian punishment, before eventually having him executed in Bactria. Alexander marched through Sogdiana, easily subduing and garrisoning cities in the area including Syropolis, a city founded by Cyrus the Great almost 200 years earlier, and Marikanda, the capital of the province. He also founded yet another Alexandria on the banks of the Jaxartes, Alexandria Eschiti, the furthest Alexandria. It finally seemed that Alexander was the undisputed king of Persia. However, things were not as simple as they seemed. While in Sogdiana, a local tribe, numbering as many as 20,000 according to some sources, attacked Alexander's men while they were foraging before retreating to high ground. Alexander was able to use his lighter troops to storm the position and win the battle, but was badly wounded with an arrow to the leg. To make matters worse, the recently conquered provinces of Sogdiana and Bactria both rose up in rebellion, led by Spitamenes, the same noble who had led the party that removed Bessus from power. 
Seven of the cities that Alexander had taken, including Syropolis, had their garrisons massacred by local tribes, while Spitamenes himself besieged Marikanda. Alexander split his army into three, a few thousand under Phanikis being sent to relieve Marikanda, more under Craterus besieging Syropolis, where most of the rebel forces were focused, while Alexander focused on storming five of the smaller cities. In doing so, he hoped to defeat the enemy in detail, damaging the morale of those in Syropolis. Alexander wasted no time besieging any of his targets. He attacked Gaza first, using his missile troops and siege engines to clear the enemy from the walls before using siege ladders to break inside and putting all the men there to the sword. The next two cities suffered the same treatment, the Macedonians using siege ladders to quickly scale the walls, once again slaughtering the males inside. The rebels in the final two cities, seeing smoke and refugees flowing from the other three, promptly abandoned their positions, many later being cut down by Alexander's cavalry. According to Arian, taking these five cities had taken Alexander just two days. The Macedonian king then marched to meet Craterus at Syropolis. Filled with 15,000 rebels and with strong walls, Alexander initially planned to construct siege rams to batter the walls down. He noticed, however, that the river channel leading into Syropolis had dried, offering a passage into the city. Ordering a diversionary attack on the main fortifications, Alexander secretly led his hypaspists, Agrianians and archers up the channel and into the city. With the rebels distracted by the attack on the walls, Alexander's force was able to open the gates from the inside before being noticed and having to fall back to the marketplace. The rebels abandoned the walls, determined to kill Alexander, and fierce fighting broke out, during which Alexander was again wounded with a stone to the neck and head which knocked him unconscious. Nevertheless, the open gates and abandoned walls allowed the rest of his army to pour into the city, and Seropolis was soon taken back, with 8,000 rebels dying in the process. The seventh and final city fell soon after to a rapid assault. Sometime around October, Alexander moved to Alexandria Esceti, building defences around the city and settling prisoners taken from the Sogdian cities as well as some of his older troops there. However, on the other side of the Jaxartes River, the nomadic Saka were beginning to stir. They were simultaneously frustrated by the founding of Alexandria Esceti, which in their opinion was in their sphere of influence, and were eager to exploit the chaotic situation for their own benefit. A strong cavalry force, under the command of Cathasis, brother of the Sake king, gathered on the north bank of the river. With the Bactrians and Sogdians still in revolt, Alexander had to choose to either expose his northern flank to deal with the revolt, or allow the revolt to continue but secure his borders. He chose the latter, hoping to defeat the Scythian threat before it grew in size. Alexander, his leg still healing and his voice ragged from the wound at Syropolis, amassed his army on the bank opposite the Seca, to the northeast of Alexandria Esceti. He once again ordered his men to prepare rafts to cross the river, in the same manner as they had at the Oxus. Before the battle began, however, a Sakan ambassador arrived, insisting that Alexander withdraw his force, and warning him, Beware, lest while you strive to reach the top, you fall with the very branches you have grasped. Even the lion has sometimes been the food of the smallest bird, and rust consumes iron. Alexander dismissed the ambassador and prepared his army for battle the following day. The exact numbers on either side are unknown. However, Due to there being almost no mention of Alexander's phalanx in the battle, we can presume that he only took his lighter troops and cavalry, approximately 9,000 of the former and 6,000 of the latter. We can only guess at the size of the Saka force, but given the fact that no source mentions it being significantly larger or smaller, it was likely of comparable size, composed purely of cavalry. The Sake had deployed themselves as close as possible to the river on the other bank, hoping to stop the Macedonians before they could set foot on their side. Alexander, however, set up siege weapons to fire at them from across the Jaxates, a tactic he had pioneered during his Illyrian campaign. 
these missiles forced the sake to withdraw out of range, and Alexander then gave the order for his army to begin the crossing. Men on the front of the makeshift rafts knelt, providing a screen with their shields and protecting those who were rowing from the hail of arrows as they closed in on the Saka's bank. Once they reached the other side, Alexander's Agrianians and archers immediately attacked the Saka, providing covering fire for the cavalry and infantry to disembark. Nevertheless, in order to secure victory, Alexander would have to find a way of pinning the enemy's nimble, all-cavalry army. Just as he had done previously at the Granicus, Alexander decided to make a tactical sacrifice to gain an advantage. About 1,000 footmen and a portion of the auxiliary cavalry were sent forward to attack. The Saka deftly avoided their charge, surrounding the small force, riding in circles and firing arrows into their midst. This was precisely what Alexander had wanted. Gathering his cavalry, Hypaspists, Agrianians and other light infantry, Alexander advanced. As he closed in, a detachment of the companions and light cavalry were sent to charge the Saka on the flanks of his surrounded men, while he led the light infantry and the rest of the companions in an attack on their centre. Alexander had now successfully pinned a large portion of the Saka force, and many were killed in the ensuing fight. It had been a brilliant display of Alexander's combined arms tactics. The entire Saka force quickly began to withdraw, pursued by Alexander and his cavalry. Eventually though, a mixture of nightfall, fatigue and diarrhea caused by the local water forced Alexander to call off the pursuit. Approximately 1,000 Saka had been killed and a further 150 captured, while by Rufus's account, Alexander had lost 160 with a further 1,000 wounded. A peace offering was soon sent to Alexander by the Scythian king, and Alexander, in no position to continue a war on this front, accepted. Alexander had now secured his borders. Nonetheless, within his own borders there was still trouble. Bactria and Sogdiana had still not been completely subdued, and Spitamenes was still at large besieging Maracunda, a thorn in Alexander's side. Pharnaces, the man that Alexander had entrusted with confronting Spitamenes, was only a translator though, not a military man. Alexander had assigned him the task because he thought that Pharnaces' knowledge of the local language and customs would allow him to negotiate with the rebels and help bring the revolt to a swift conclusion. To compensate for his lack of experience, he had also been assigned several of Alexander's officers to act as military advisors. When Pharnaces' force, of more than 2,000 infantry and 300 cavalry, closed in on Marikanda, Spitamenes pulled back. Pharnaces pursued eagerly, unaware that he was being lured into a trap. On the edge of the Sogdian desert, near the river Polytimetus, Spitamenes' army was reinforced by 600 Masagete cavalry and turned to face Pharnaces. The Masagete cavalry peppered the Macedonian infantry with missile fire and used quick hit-and-run tactics to harass their flanks. The Macedonian cavalry, outnumbered and less agile, was unable to drive the enemy off, and it was soon clear that the army was in a disastrous position. The infantry formed a square and retreated to nearby woods, aiming to cross the river. Without a decisive leader at their head, the officers assigned to Pharnaces communicated poorly, the cavalry crossing the river first and the infantry following without having been given an order to do so. The crossing was chaotic, and Spitamenes' force kept harassing the force as they crossed, some of his men managing to cross the river at other forts and attack Pharnaces from the opposite bank. Pharnaces' force was now surrounded, and the entire force of 2,000 infantry and 300 horsemen were either cut down or captured. It was the largest military loss Alexander's army ever suffered in Asia. Alexander, returning from the Jaxartes and hearing the news, immediately marched on Marikanda, where Spitamenes had returned to besiege. Upon hearing of his approach, Spitamenes again retreated westwards towards the desert, with Alexander in pursuit. Spitamenes began to withdraw further into the desert. Alexander, however, could not be so easily lured and turned his army back to Marikanda, burying Phanukis' dead en route as best he could. Unable to catch Spitamenes, Alexander proceeded to carry out brutal reprisals on the Sogdians. 
It was during these reprisals that some sources, namely Diodorus and Strabo, claimed that Alexander came upon a town inhabited by the Branchiadi, a Greek tribe who had sided with the Persians during the Persian Wars, and had been given land further in the empire by Xerxes as a reward for their loyalty. The Branchiadi surrendered, but Alexander nevertheless ordered that they all be massacred, likely in a brutal attempt to show himself carrying out the original objective of the campaign, avenging the Greek city-states for the Persian Wars. The details for this particular event are vague, and some modern historians do question its validity, but all agree that even if the massacre of the Branchiadi is debatable, Alexander's actions in Sogdiana are not. For the rest of the summer of 329, his army devastated the area, burning fields of crops, and according to Rufus, Alexander ordered the death of all men of military age. The total number killed during this period cannot be known for sure, but some modern historians, such as Vicante and Worthington, suggests that the number may have been as high as 120,000. Despite this, the revolt continued, and Alexander found himself embroiled in a guerrilla war, unable to defeat his enemies in one decisive battle. To adapt to this, Alexander split his army into parts, under the commands of Hephaestion, Ptolemy, Perdiccas Coenus, and himself. This could be considered one of the earliest examples of a core system, that Napoleon Bonaparte would use so successfully to his advantage two millennia later. Each of these corps would operate independently, suppressing any resistance they could. At the same time, Alexander founded a further six cities in the area to try and bring the province under control once and for all. However, even after he received reinforcements of 20,000 infantry and 4,000 cavalry from the western satrapies and Greece, the revolt persisted. In the spring of 328, the army rejoined at Marikanda. The governor of the province, Arzabazas, had asked to retire due to his old age, and Alexander accepted, appointing Cletus the Black as his replacement. While in the city, Alexander and his officers performed a religious ritual, which, as was often the case, later developed into a drinking party. The sources vary about exactly what was said by who, but as the evening progressed and all the men became drunk, some of the younger officers began to praise Alexander, comparing him to Heracles, to the annoyance of the older officers. Soon after, Alexander himself even began to claim that he was superior to his father, Philip. At this point, Cletus, who had fought under Philip and whose sister had helped raise Alexander, spoke up, saying, Alexander's deeds were neither in fact so great or marvellous, nor had he achieved them by himself, but for the most part they were the deeds of the Macedonians. Cletus even began praising Parmenion and criticizing Alexander for allowing Persians into his court and embracing more Persian customs, at which point Alexander leapt up, calling Cletus a coward. Cletus retorted, It was this cowardice of mine, however, that saved your life, God born as you are. Referencing when he had saved Alexander at the Granicus, Alexander lunged at Cletus, but was held back by his personal bodyguards, who also discreetly removed his sword, trying to defuse the situation. Alexander called for his other guards, but none came, and Cletus was effectively dragged out of the room by other officers. With Cletus gone, Alexander's friends tried to calm him, begging him to leave the matter for tomorrow. As they were doing so, though, Cletus burst back into the room, quoting a line of Euripides, Alas, in Hellas, what an evil government! Enraged, Alexander grabbed a spear from one of the guards and stabbed Cletus, killing him. Alexander immediately regretted his actions and turned the spear around, about to kill himself, but was restrained by his bodyguards. They then carried the king to bed, where Alexander remained for the next few days, refusing food and drink, weeping and crying out Cletus's name. It is important to understand that this was not just a case of a friend killing a friend. By killing Cletus at a banquet where they had shared food and drink, Alexander had broken the rules of Xenia, the rules of Greek hospitality that were sacred to Zeus, who Alexander had been proclaimed the son of. Numerous attempts to console him, including from court historian and philosopher Callisthenes, failed. It was only when Anisarchus, another philosopher, pointed out to Alexander that as the king of kings and son of Zeus Amon, the laws did not apply to him in the same way that Alexander was pulled out of his depression. 
Though Alexander clearly did regret his actions, the death of Cletus does reveal a dark side to Alexander. Kani, a leading Alexander historian, has argued that Cletus's death, while not planned, may have been motivated in part by the justification that Anazarchus provided that Alexander wanted to rule as the unquestionable king of kings, in contrast to traditional Macedonian monarchy where nobles like Cletus would often feel free to criticize their king. Worthington takes a less sympathetic view of the matter, arguing that the episode shows how petty Alexander could be, particularly when it came to comparisons between him and his father. It is also perhaps worth noting the detail that Alexander's bodyguards had apparently taken the precaution of removing Alexander's sword, possibly suggesting that it was not the first time that Alexander had become violent when drunk. While all this had been going on, Spitamenes and his Massagetian allies were still at large, having avoided Alexander's forces and were harassing cities in Bactria, extracting bribes from some and defeating at least one garrison that sallied out against him. Alexander again decided to split his force, sending part of the army into Bactria, forcing Spitamenes to retreat towards the Massagete border. Craterus, in command of part of the army, heard of this and moved his force to try and catch Spitamenes once and for all, catching up to his 1,000 strong force on the edge of a desert. In the ensuing battle, Craterus was able to secure a victory, but the majority of Spitamenes' agile force was able to escape having lost just 150 men. Despite this setback, Spitamenes had, nevertheless, been largely successful in his guerrilla campaign, with even more men from Massagete, increasing his force to 4,000. When Spitamenes and this army arrived back in Soctiana, sometime near the end of 328 or the start of 327, they found the province well defended by the new forts Alexander had constructed all with strong garrisons. Coenus, stationed in the area by Alexander with a force of approximately 4,000 infantry, 400 cavalry and an unknown number of horse archers that had recently been added to Alexander's army, set out in pursuit. Spitamenes, seeing that there were no easy targets in the province to attack, finally decided to meet the Macedonians in a pitched battle near Bagay. The details of the battle are unknown, but the result was a victory for Coenus. Arian giving his losses as being just 32, while Spitamenes lost 800. These numbers, particularly Coenus's casualties, are likely inaccurate, but it is clear that it was a decisive victory for Coenus. Spitamenes himself survived the battle, but was soon betrayed by the Massagete, who cut off his head and sent it to Alexander to make peace. Spitamenes had been one of the most tenacious opponents Alexander had faced, using guerrilla warfare to maximize the effectiveness of his smaller force, consistently avoiding being pinned down, and had even inflicted the largest military defeat on Alexander's army. His death meant that the end of the bactrian soctian revolt was almost in sight, with only a few local tribes in mountainous citadels continuing to defy Alexander. The taking of these fortresses would require some of the most creative tactics in Alexander's career, the most notable of these holdouts was the so-called Sogdian Rock, a mountain fortress under the command of Ariamazes, where a number of rebellious tribal leaders and their families had sought refuge. Early in 327, Alexander left his winter quarters of Nautica and advanced towards the Sogdian Rock. On the march, however, a colossal blizzard swept in and temperatures plummeted. Alexander ordered that huge areas of forest be cut down and burnt to keep the men warm, and rode throughout the army, encouraging his men on. But nonetheless, the cold took its toll on many, some men freezing to death as they leaned against trees to take a short rest. The storm continued for three days, by the end of which 2,000 of Alexander's men had died, possibly more than he had lost in any single battle up to this point. In time, Alexander finally reached the Sogdian Rock which, according to Rufus, was garrisoned by as many as 30,000 soldiers. This number is remarkably high, however, and it is possible that Rufus had mistakenly included civilians in his counting. Nevertheless, the rock was widely considered to be unconquerable. It was well defended, with supplies to last a siege for at least two years, and was located in a strong defensive location, surrounded by steep cliffs 
and made even more secure by the winter snow that would make any assault particularly difficult. As a result of these factors, when Alexander arrived with his army and sent emissaries demanding Ariamazes' surrender, he was strongly rebuffed, the Sogdians laughing, claiming that Alexander would need winged soldiers to conquer the place. As the siege of Tyre had shown, however, Alexander was not one to be intimidated by the notion of a place being unconquerable. Ariamazes had stationed his men on the walls facing Alexander's army, but had neglected to man the cliff at his rear, confident that such an approach would be impossible. Alexander seized on this opportunity. He requested 300 volunteers from his army who had climbing experience, and offered prizes to all who completed the climb including a handsome reward of 12 talents to the first man to reach the top of the cliff. In order for the move to be kept hidden from Ariamazes, the climb would have to be done under the cover of darkness, making the already perilous mission even more dangerous. Nonetheless, Alexander got his volunteers, and after supplying them with iron tent pegs and ropes, they began the climb. It was a difficult ascent, with 30 of the men falling to their deaths, Alexander anxiously watching the top of the cliff throughout the night for the signal from his men that they had succeeded. At dawn, he finally saw his men at the summit, waving white sheets as had been prearranged. With these men in position, Alexander moved his main force forward, and again requested Ariamazes' surrender. Again he was refused, until Alexander pointed to the top of the cliffs behind Ariamazes' position saying that he did indeed have winged soldiers. Ariamazes, unable to tell just how many men were threatening his rear, surrendered without a fight. Alexander's force marched in unopposed, and many of the Sogdian nobles were either captured or executed for their part in the revolt. There was only one last place of significance to resistance to Alexander, the Rock of Koryenes, under the command of Sisamithris. It was also an incredibly well-defended position, surrounded on all sides by steep cliffs and a ravine, with the only path leading to the rock being narrow, steep, and easily defended. Once again Alexander sent emissaries, demanding the Sogdians surrender, and once again he was rebuffed. Undeterred, Alexander prepared to take another place considered unconquerable. He first constructed ladders, allowing his men to descend into the ravine, where they began the process of hammering stakes into both sides. On top of these, they constructed supports, building a bridge and packing earth on top. Much like at Tyre, Alexander planned to construct a land bridge across the ravine so that his army would be able to attack from level ground. His army was split into three rotating divisions that continued to work day and night, but progress was nonetheless slow thanks to the snowy conditions and harassing arrows from Sisimithres' men. Wooden screens were soon created to protect the workers, and Alexander's men continued the construction, slowly closing in on the Sogdians. To add to the growing intimidation, Alexander also brought up his siege engines in position to begin a bombardment of the defences. Before any attack began, however, Alexander sent a final emissary to the Sogdians. The emissary stressed to Sisimithres how dire his situation was becoming, and that once Alexander's causeway was complete and the siege engines began firing, his defeat would be inevitable. Disheartened, Sisimithres also surrendered without a fight. The taking of the Rock of Koryenes marks the end of the Bactrian Sogdian revolt. Soon after the siege, Alexander took his first wife, a local princess named Roxana. She and her father, Oxyates, had taken refuge at either the Sogdian Rock or Rock of Koryenes, depending on the source. When Alexander first saw her, he is supposed to have fallen in love immediately, considering her the most beautiful woman in Asia. The marriage also served a political purpose for Alexander though, tying him closely to the local nobility and helping to subdue the unruly Bactrians and Sogdians. It had taken Alexander approximately two years to completely subdue the two satrapies, roughly the same amount of time that it had taken him to conquer lands from the Aegean to Egypt. It was, without a doubt, the most difficult period of Alexander's campaign so far, and cost his army the largest number of casualties. 
Approximately 5,000 of Alexander's men had been lost to Spitamenes' guerrilla tactics throughout the course of the revolt, and at least a further 2,000 to Colt. The revolt had shown that Alexander was not only a master of tactical, but also of psychological warfare, taking two supposedly unconquerable places without a fight. However, it also highlighted some of the darkest aspects of Alexander's character. Though often benevolent to his enemies, his brutal tactics in Sogdiana showed how willing he was to use fear and force as a means of control. Similarly, the murder of Cletus showed that, despite how mature and reasonable Alexander could be, he could also be petty, hot-tempered, and tyrannical. His marriage to Roxana, though beneficial in the short term, was unpopular with many in his army, who now had what they considered a barbarian queen and would prove to be a significant issue in the long run. With the revolt crushed, Alexander was the undisputed master of the Persian Empire. Alexander would spare no time to revel in this achievement, however, and was already planning his next campaign, which would take him into the Indian subcontinent. When the army had moved from Marikanda to Bactria, the Persianization of Alexander came to arguably its most dramatic climax. It was customary in the Persian court for those entering the presence of the great king to perform proskinesis, prostrating oneself on the ground and kissing the floor or the feet of the king. The Persians were now dutifully performing this ceremonial act for Alexander, who began suggesting that his officers should follow suit. His motivation for doing so is unclear, but many of his Hellenic officers and advisers were firmly against the idea none more so than the historian, philosopher, and nephew of Aristotle, Callisthenes. At one point, while Alexander's companions were discussing the topic outside of his presence, Callisthenes reportedly said, Divinity sometimes overtakes a man, but it never accompanies him. I am not ashamed of my fatherland, nor do I desire to learn from the vanquished how I ought to honour my king. They are the victors if we accept from them the laws under which we live. These words certainly encapsulated how many men felt, but were swiftly reported to Alexander, painting a target on the back of Callisthenes. While in Bactria, Alexander led a royal hunt with his companions and the royal pages. It was the right of the king to have the first kill, but on this occasion, one of the pages, Hermelaus, struck first, killing a boar that Alexander was aiming for, in return for which Alexander had the young man publicly beaten. Infuriated and humiliated, Hermelaus began plotting to assassinate Alexander, recruiting several other pages to partake in the plot. Part of the duties of the royal pages was to guard the king while he slept, and so they planned to strike while Alexander was sleeping. It took them 32 days to arrange their guard duties so that there would be no one else to interfere with their plans, but finally the moment came. Alexander was at a drinking party, and the conspirators were all on guard duty, prepared to strike once Alexander returned. However, through sheer chance, Alexander either decided to drink all through the night until morning, or made for bed but was convinced to stay out drinking by a drunk woman. By the time Alexander made for bed, it was morning, and new guards had arrived to take over the duties of Hermelaus and his comrades. They had, nonetheless, hung around with the new guards, hoping for an opportunity to strike. A drunk Alexander approached and greeted them warmly, thanking them for staying guard throughout the night, and even longer than was expected of them. He gave each a monetary reward in gratitude and sent the would-be assassins home. It was undoubtedly one of the most incredible lucky escapes in history. The next day, one of the conspirators, Epimenes, had a change of heart, and the details were soon passed on to Ptolemy and Leonatus, two of Alexander's personal bodyguards. No doubt remembering the fate of Philotus, they immediately woke Alexander and told him of the plot. Epimenes was spared, but Hermelaus and the other conspirators were arrested. Callisthenes had not been implicated, but part of his duties was to educate the pages, and so he too was arrested. The following account of the trial is based largely from Rufus, who gives the most detail. It is important therefore to note that Rufus was writing during the first century of the Roman Empire, 
and that the speeches he puts in Hermelaus's mouth may reflect his own political views. Nevertheless, his account certainly embodies feelings and accusations common among all the extant histories of Alexander, and are thus likely a fair reflection of what at least some people at the time felt. Furthermore, just because Rufus may have seen parallels between Alexander and later Roman emperors, it does not negate the fact that the same grievances may have existed. The pages were brought in front of Alexander to stand trial, Callisthenes remaining in prison for the time being. Their parents and relatives were also present, no doubt nervous considering the fate of Parmenion when Philotas had been convicted. The pages all confessed, and Alexander demanded to know what he had done that warranted his murder. Hermelaus arguing that it was because he treated his subjects as slaves, and that he used men for murder and then discarded or killed them, like Philotas, Parmenion and Cletus. Twice, Hermelaus' father rushed forward to silence his son, at one point even snatching up a sword and preparing to kill him. Both times he was restrained, and Hermelaus was ordered to continue. Hermelaus began to unleash a tirade of accusations against Alexander, saying that Alexander only kept Callisthenes imprisoned because he was scared about what the historian would have to say and stressing that Callisthenes had nothing to do with the attempted assassination. Hermelaus also claimed that Alexander had, through his adoption of Persian dress, Persian customs and Persian advisers, made himself the king of Persia. Hermelaus had not, he therefore claimed, planned to kill the king of Macedonia, he had planned to kill a deserter and the king of Persia. Alexander had scorned Macedonian customs, acted like a god, treated his men like slaves, and they were sick of it. Hermelaus asked for his relatives to be spared, but requested that he and his conspirators should be executed, so that they could, at the very least, die showing how Alexander treated his subjects. It was a damning list of accusations and surely echoed concerns held by many in Alexander's army. Alexander, however, had his own equally eloquent response. He argued that Hermelaus was motivated largely by the beating Alexander had ordered he receive, pointing out that this was the right of Macedonian kings, and that part of the role of being a page was to be disciplined in such ways, saying, orders are made mild by obedience. He pointed out all the riches, glory and honour that the men he led had reaped thanks to him, and that he had not invaded Persia to destroy the empire but to conquer it, arguing that the only way that they would rule as conquerors was if the Persians accepted them. With regard to the accusation that he had embraced Persian customs, Alexander responded, True, for I see in many nations things we should not blush to imitate. Alexander continued, pointing out that he had not asked to be a god, but that he had nonetheless been proclaimed as the son of one. He had embraced this idea because it was advantageous to do so, stating that war depends on reputation and that Macedonians needed to be considered invincible. He concluded by saying that the relatives would be spared and that he had never intended to kill them, and the reason that Callisthenes was not present was because he was an Olynthian, a Greek. Alexander had done Hermelaus and the pages, all Macedonians, the courtesy of seeing them first. Hermelaus and his fellow pages were executed after the trial. Callisthenes likely followed soon after, executed without a trial. However, some sources do instead record that he was simply kept imprisoned for the rest of his life and died of disease. The pages plot was the assassination attempt that so far had come closest to killing Alexander, and there's still no certainty whether or not Callisthenes was involved. Rufus and Plutarch categorically state that Callisthenes was not, while Arian notes that Aristobulus and Ptolemy, both contemporaries of the event, said Callisthenes was named as a conspirator, although Arian doubts that this is true. Broadly, this is the same consensus as modern historians. While some sources do claim that Callisthenes had previously told Hermelaus that he was a man and deserved to be treated as one, or that if he wanted glory he could easily achieve it by killing the most famous man of all, it is unclear how true these claims are, or if they are later fabrications to exonerate Alexander. Most modern historians such as Carney, Borza and Greenwalt see the episode as yet another occasion where Alexander used the conspiracy to clean house and remove a critic. In the Roman writer Seneca's words, the execution of Callisthenes was 
the eternal crime of Alexander, which no virtue or felicity of his in war shall ever be able to redeem. Alexander's preparations for the Indian campaign continued. His motivations for the invasion were numerous. Parts of the subcontinent had been under Persian rule, and they had committed soldiers to the Persian war effort, even as recently as the Battle of Gorgamela, both giving Alexander justification for his invasion. He also may have hoped to make it to the Outer Ocean, the modern Indian Ocean, to have it form the eastern border of his empire. There were also strong personal motivations, such as Alexander's desire to emulate, and possibly even outdo, Cyrus the Great, Heracles and Dionysus, who were regular sources of inspiration for Alexander and had links to the area. Diplomatic missions had already begun, mainly with the kingdoms and tribes along the Indus River, some of whom, such as the king of Taxila, had already paid tribute and sworn allegiance to Alexander, providing him with a toehold in the area. Alexander also, according to ancient sources, amassed an army of 120,000 infantry and 15,000 cavalry, though modern historians question how logistically realistic this number is, often preferring a number closer to 70,000, including the baggage train. Leaving approximately 10,000 men to keep Bactria in check, Alexander advanced towards the subcontinent. Alexander decided to split his army into two parts, targeting the Coffin Valley. The first, consisting of approximately 5,000 infantry, 2,000 cavalry, and Indian allies under the command of Hephaestion and Perdiccas, would secure Alexander's foothold in the region. They would follow the Kabul River and march through the Khyber Pass, areas that had pledged allegiance to Alexander, ensuring loyalty and eventually reaching the Indus, where they would prepare boats and a pontoon bridge for crossing. Alexander, meanwhile, would take the rest of the force to secure their rear by marching along the Kunar River through Bajor and Swat, areas where Alexander had not received any embassies from, before reuniting with Hephaestion and Perdiccas at the Indus. For the most part, Hephaestion and Perdiccas made good progress, meeting little resistance, with the majority of the locals in the area affirming their loyalty to Alexander. There was only one city, Pukalautis, that offered significant resistance, but it was taken after a 30-day siege and the force pushed on to the Indus to prepare the crossing. Alexander's route, however, proved to be far more difficult. The Aspasians, one of the first peoples he came across, retreated to their cities and to the mountains, forcing Alexander to siege them individually. During one of these sieges, Alexander was once again wounded, only being saved by his breastplate. Ptolemy and Leonatus also being wounded. The city, for its resistance, was leveled and the prisoners were killed. Soon after, Alexander was able to catch the remnants of the Aspasian force along with their king and defeated them, Ptolemy killing the king personally. Alexander next faced a large force of Goraeans, a people regarded as being particularly warlike, who had taken up a strong defensive position on high ground. In order to lure the enemy into battle, Alexander split his army into three parts, Leonatus being given command of approximately 6,000 infantry, including 1,000 hypaspists, Ptolemy commanding 1,000 hypaspists, 3,000 of the phalanx and Agrianians, and half the horse archers. Both these divisions were placed on the flanks and advanced out of sight of the enemy. Alexander, meanwhile, commanded the rest of the army and advanced to the center. The Goraeans, only seeing Alexander's outnumbered part of the army, charged down from the high ground to attack Alexander's center. As they did so, Leonatus and Ptolemy advanced with their forces on the flanks. Ptolemy's flank faced particularly stiff resistance, but Alexander and Leonatus were having much greater success, and eventually attacked on three sides, the Goraeans broke, with Arian claiming that 40,000 were taken prisoner, though it is unclear how accurate that figure is. Alexander pushed on into the lands of the Asikeni. They refused to give battle in the open, instead falling back to their cities, Alexander pursuing and preparing to lay siege to their capital, Masaga. Masaga, however, had hired 7,000 well-trained and disciplined mercenaries to assist them, and when Alexander drew near, they sallied out. Alexander quickly halted his advance, ordering his men to withdraw to a nearby hill, 
hoping to lure the enemy away from their city walls. The Asakeni, thinking Alexander was retreating, broke ranks as they charged. As they closed in, however, Alexander ordered his missiles to turn and fire, simultaneously charging them with his light cavalry. The Asakeni were caught out of formation and lost 200 in this initial skirmish before falling back to their city. Alexander pushed on, besieging the city and preparing siege works for an assault. The first assault, aimed at breaking down the walls, was repulsed by the defenders, Alexander receiving another minor wound. The next nine days were spent building a large siege tower to attack the walls. When it was completed, the tower was rolled forward with archers and slingers on the top, firing missiles onto the defenders to try and clear them from the walls. The tower's bridge was then extended, Alexander ordering the Hypaspids forward to attack. However, too many attempted to cross the bridge at once, and it crumbled, many Hypaspids crashing to the ground. Many were wounded by their fall, and the defenders unleashed a barrage of arrows and stones into them. Alexander quickly sent 1,500 footmen to recover as many of the wounded as possible. The bridge was repaired, and another attack was mounted the following day, which was once again repulsed. However, during the attack, the king of the Masaga was killed, and his wife, Cleophis, began negotiations of surrender. Alexander promised to spare the city, so long as the Eskeni pledged allegiance to him and the mercenaries joined his army. These terms were agreed to, the mercenaries and their families leaving the city and camping on a hill near Alexander's force. However, once they were all gathered there, Alexander ordered his army to surround and attack them. The mercenaries fought back bravely, forming a circle with their families in the center and desperately shouting to Alexander that he was breaking the peace agreement. The attack continued nevertheless, Theodorus even claiming that some of the women took up the weapons of their fallen husbands to fight back. By the end of it, all of the mercenaries and their families had either been cut down or taken prisoner. Arian, in his account, claimed that the mercenaries had been planning to scatter during the night, which was what had provoked Alexander's actions. He is, however, alone in making this claim. Even if this was the case, however, it would not change the fact that Alexander knowingly broke a peace treaty, an act of treachery that both Plutarch and Diodorus view as a serious blight on Alexander's career. The result of Alexander's actions was that the remaining Eskeni became even more resolute, most taking refuge in a fortress atop the Ornos mountain, possibly the modern Pirsar. It was a place, like the Sogdian and Kerenese rock, that was considered impregnable, the mountain surrounded by a river and various crags. Nonetheless, taking it was essential for Alexander's strategy, in order for him to have full control of the Coffin Valley, and allow him to progress to the Indus with his rear secure. Alexander advanced on the fortress with perhaps 10,000 men, leaving the rest with Craterus to forage for supplies. The fortress itself was located on the mountain's eastern summit, Alexander approaching and encamping at the base. A local offered for a reward to show Alexander a path to an advantageous position, an offer Alexander gladly accepted, offering 80 talents. Following this guide, Ptolemy led the Agrianians, light infantry, and a few hundred hypaspists along a circuitous mountain path, avoiding detection by the enemy until they were in position on the western summit. When there, Ptolemy reinforced his position with a barricade and used fires to signal his success to Alexander. It seems that Alexander was planning to use the same tactics he had used at the Sogdian Rock, threatening to attack the Esakeni from two sides. He advanced with his main force the next day to attack, but the terrain proved too difficult and he was forced to withdraw. The Asakeni seized the opportunity and instead attacked the position of Ptolemy, trying to dislodge his force. Ptolemy's group was outnumbered, but well dug in and fought back desperately, the fighting continuing throughout the day and only ending with nightfall. Ptolemy's force had managed to repulse the attackers, but the Asakeni did seem to have managed to keep a force in the area to overlook the mountain path Ptolemy had taken. With the initial plan having failed, Alexander changed tactics. A part of the army was left guarding the paths around the mountain to maintain the siege while the rest of his army went up the path Ptolemy had taken and rejoined him. As they marched up this path, 
they were continuously harassed by arrows and stones, with many men being wounded and progress being slow. It may have taken as many as two days, but eventually Alexander's army gained the summit, reuniting with Ptolemy. However, ravines still made an approach to the fortress itself difficult. As a result, just as he had done at the Rock of Kerenes, Alexander ordered the construction of a bridge in order to get his siege weapons into position. Working day and night, his engineers began construction of the bridge, wooden screens being used to protect them as much as possible from enemy fire, and using his missile troops to hold off sallies from the Asakeni. After four days, the bridge was completed and the engines were brought into position. The Asakeni, at this point, saw the writing on the wall. What happened next is not entirely clear. According to Arian, the Asakeni offered peace terms, but then attempted to slip away the following night. Rufus, on the other hand, claims that for two nights, the Asakeni loudly beat drums and kept torches lit throughout the night, and then on the third night, lit all the torches as usual and then tried to escape the fortress. Whichever was the case, Alexander discovered the attempt and ordered his men maintaining the siege to stand down, allowing the Asakeni to begin their retreat. He then rushed the fortress with 700 men, falling upon the Asakeni rear as they retreated, while the men guarding the base of the mountain simultaneously attacked. A significant number managed to escape, but the rest were captured and enslaved. Due to the contradictory nature of our available sources, it is not clear if this was yet another case of Alexander treacherously breaking a peace, or if he had seen through the ruse and predicted the withdrawal. With the fortress taken, the Coffin Valley was subdued, and Alexander marched to the Indus, reuniting with Hephaestion and Perdiccas, and crossed his whole army across the Indus using the pontoon bridge prepared for them. From here, he marched to the allied Taxila, receiving more allied local forces, including elephants, while doing so. At Taxila, he rested his men for a while and inquired about other tribes in the area. At the time, much of North India, where Alexander eventually planned to campaign, consisted of the powerful Nanda Empire, ruled by Dana Nanda. His empire stretched from Odisha in the east to the Hyphasis River in the west, and was said to be able to field hundreds of thousands of soldiers. Before confronting this empire, however, Alexander needed to subdue the numerous kingdoms that lay between the Taxila and Hyphasis in order to secure his rear. Emissaries had already been sent to the local kings, notably Abyssaris and Porus, requesting tribute and that they meet Alexander on the borders of their kingdoms. Abyssaris submitted to Alexander, but Porus, king of the Pauravas, was more stubborn. While little is known about Porus, it is clear from Greek sources that he was a formidable ruler. He was a renowned warrior, brave, strong, and standing an intimidating seven feet tall, and his physical attributes were matched by his intelligence, Porus being described as a wise, cunning, and respected leader. In response to Alexander's request, Porus replied that he would indeed meet him on his border, but that he would bring an army with him. Never one to refuse a challenge, Alexander, amid the monsoon season, marched to the Hydaspes with a force of approximately 30 to 40,000 infantry, 7,000 cavalry, and 5,000 Taxilian allies. On the opposite bank, they saw the Pauravas army, 35,000 infantry, 4,000 cavalry, 300 chariots, and approximately 100 elephants. At their head, riding a large elephant, was Porus himself. Porus had chosen his battlefield well. The Hydaspes was wide and fast-flowing, meaning that any contested crossing, as Alexander had done at the Granicus, would be near impossible. He had further capitalized on his position by stationing his elephants in front of his battle line, knowing that their very presence would spook Alexander's horses and make any crossing even more difficult. Time was also on Porus's side. Abyssaris, though he had previously submitted to Alexander, had also promised to reinforce Porus. Alexander needed a quick victory, but with a frontal attack out of the question, a more cunning strategy would be needed. Alexander made his camp in clear view of Porus's men and sent out foraging parties. At the same time, he sent numerous scouting parties up and down the river, ensuring that they made plenty of noise while doing so. 
Porus in turn kept the majority of his force drawn up opposite Alexander's camp, but sent his own troops to mirror Alexander's scouts along the riverbank. The charade continued for days, Alexander's men bringing supplies into their camp and his scouting parties riding along the river with Porus's men mirroring their movements. Eventually Porus became convinced that Alexander would wait for the monsoon season to end and was only scouting for future landing spots and stopped sending his men to parallel Alexander's movements. This was precisely what Alexander had been hoping for. Alexander had already identified his crossing point, approximately 18 miles upstream from his camp and densely wooded. The thick foliage had provided enough cover for Alexander's men to assemble rafts and boats in the area in preparation for his crossing, Alexander's feigned scouting missions hiding their movements. With these preparations made, and Porus lured into a false sense of security, Alexander made his move. He ordered the campfires to be kept burning, had his usual guard stationed outside his tent, and even dressed one of his companions as a double, and then, during the night, slipped away towards the crossing with 6,000 infantry, including phalangites, silver shields, hypaspists, agrianians, archers, and 5,000 cavalry. Thanks to Alexander's numerous feints, any movement seen by Porus's army gave no concern. Craterus, meanwhile, was left in command of the majority of the army in camp, with Meliga and a force of mercenaries stationed between the camp and the crossing. The initial strategy was that Craterus's force would maintain the facade of the full army being encamped. Meliga's force would act as a further distraction by threatening a crossing, while Alexander would make the real crossing in secret and surprise Porus's force, hoping to lure the elephants towards him. Craterus would then also cross and catch Porus's army in a pincer, Meliega crossing where possible to join the fight. With his plans in place, Alexander's force prepared to cross. A thunderstorm swept through, threatening to derail the mission, but it soon died down, the heavy rain and cloud providing more cover for Alexander. His men crossed the Hadaspes to the assigned landing point. Upon completing the crossing, however, Alexander realized that he had made a mistake. What he had considered the opposite bank was in fact a large island, separated from Porus's bank by another channel of the river. As quickly as they could, Alexander's men brought the rafts and boats across the island to cross this channel, but by the time they made foot on the other bank, it was nearing dawn, and they were spotted by Porus's scouts before Alexander's force could properly assemble. Though Alexander's previous maneuvers had allowed him to cross unopposed, his plan had been based on him having the element of surprise, and that advantage was now lost. He would now have to face Porus's force head on, with only a quarter of his army. Porus quickly sent 2,000 cavalry and 120 chariots under the command of his son to engage Alexander's force while they completed the crossing. To buy time for his infantry, Alexander sent his horse archers to engage the chariots, splitting his own cavalry into numerous squadrons to surround the Poravids, and charged. Fortunately for Alexander, the heavy rain had made much of the terrain almost impossible for Porus's chariots to maneuver in, and his men quickly gained the upper hand, killing 400, including Porus's son, before they retreated to the main force. They had, nonetheless, delayed Alexander enough for Porus to make his own preparations. Leaving a small force to contest any crossing from Craterus, Porus turned the majority of his army to Alexander cavalry and chariots on the flanks, infantry in the centre, and with his elephants in front, intending to use them to break Alexander's infantry formation. With Porus's army drawn up for battle, and Alexander's initial plan of surprising Porus shattered, he recalled his cavalry, waited for his infantry to catch up, and formulated a new strategy. Alexander knew that the elephants would be the biggest threat to his army, and so, rather than attack Porus's center immediately, he planned to crush Porus's cavalry on the flanks first. In order to do so, Alexander split his more numerous cavalry into two parts. The majority, under his personal command, would attack Porus's left, aiming to lure all the enemy cavalry to that side of the battle, which would allow the second part, under Coenus, to flank around Porus's right and attack the Paravos cavalry from the rear. The infantry, meanwhile, would advance slowly, 
but with strict orders not to engage until they saw that Coenus's movement had been successful. After giving his men time enough to recover their breath from the river crossing, Alexander began his attack, launching 1,000 horse archers at Porus's left. While the Poravian cavalry was thrown into disarray by the storm of arrows, Alexander led his companions and the bulk of his cavalry around to hit their flank. Just as Alexander had planned, Porus diverted his cavalry from the right to reinforce his left. Coenus now made his move, flanking the Indian right and circling around to hit Porus's cavalry in the rear. The Poravian horse, attacked from two sides, soon broke under the pressure retreating towards the safety of the elephants in the center. Porus began to move his elephants to attack Alexander's cavalry to try and save his left, but Alexander's horses were easily able to pull back before the slower elephants could engage them. Meanwhile, Alexander's phalanx had now closed in on the Indian center, attacking the mass of infantry, elephants, and scattered cavalry. The elephants charged the phalanx, but Alexander had already prepared his men for fighting the beasts. Where possible, the phalanx gave ground to absorb their charge, thrusting their long sarissas at the mahouts or aiming for the elephant's eyes. Agrianians and light infantry were also sent against them, some attacking with javelins, some chopping at the elephant's trunks and legs with axes and swords. Nevertheless, the elephants caused heavy casualties, trampling many, picking up and throwing men with their trunks, and impaling others on their tusks. It was a scene of utter carnage. The elephants though, many of whom were wounded and terrified, soon began to desperately try and escape the chaos, rampaging back through Porus's infantry and causing still more casualties. Alexander and the cavalry meanwhile kept attacking the sides and rear of Porus's center, until Porus's army was completely surrounded, the phalanx pushing from the front, Alexander and the cavalry from the rear, and the panicking elephants running a mark in the middle. Under such fierce pressure, Porus's men gradually started to break, fleeing through the gaps in Alexander's cavalry. By this point in the battle, Trateris and Melega had crossed the river with their portions of the army, pursuing the routing forces. Though some of the Pauravas had broken, others still fought on, Porus among them. Surrounded by his personal guard, he fought bravely for as long as any of his men did, throwing javelins from atop his elephant. He was wounded numerous times in the fighting though, at one point almost losing consciousness due to blood loss and was eventually compelled by his men to retreat, the battle now clearly being lost. Alexander, however, had been impressed by Porus's determination and bravery and sent men after him, compelling him to surrender. Wounded as badly as he was, it is debatable how much say Porus truly had. Nevertheless, he gave himself up and was brought to Alexander. Upon being asked how he wished to be treated, Porus famously replied, Treat me as a king. His request was granted. Porus was treated by Alexander's best physicians and was allowed to rule as a vassal king under Alexander. The battle had been one of Alexander's masterpieces, as it displayed his mastery of psychological warfare, as well as feints and logistical knowledge, in effecting a crossing of more than 10,000 men in the night undetected. Once the initial plan had been foiled, Alexander also demonstrated his ability to devise a winning strategy under pressure and in moments. Arian claims Alexander and Porus's losses as 310 and 23,000 respectively, while Diodorus suggests over 1,000 dead for Alexander, Porus suffering 12,000 dead and 9,000 captured. Given the chaotic nature described in all the sources, particularly the role of the elephants, most modern historians tend to agree that Diodorus's figures are more realistic. Among Alexander's casualties was his horse, Bucephalus, who was either killed during the battle or died soon after, possibly from wounds he sustained there. Bucephalus had carried Alexander since boyhood, through numerous campaigns and battles, and his death affected Alexander deeply, the king even founding a city, Bucephala, in his honor. At this point, it is worth addressing the myth that Alexander in fact lost the Battle of Hydaspes to Porus. Proponents of this idea point to the fact that Bucephalus died, that Porus was kept as king, and that there are only Greek sources for the battle as evidence for this view. 
They also cite the account of Justin and the Alexander romance, both of which claim that Porus and Alexander dueled each other on the battlefield, Porus killing Bucephalus in this version. The arguments are weak. Justin's reliability leaves much to be desired, as his work is a summary of a previous more detailed account, and varies wildly in its accuracy. The Alexander romance is even more problematic. Though some parts of it are rooted in historical sources, it was adapted by many cultures over centuries, eventually becoming more like a myth or fairy tale of Alexander's life than true history. The Alexander romance, for instance, claims that Bucephalus was a man-eating horse, that Alexander used 24,000 metal elephants at the Battle of Hydaspes, and that Porus used magicians in the battle. To no surprise, the text is largely considered unreliable. It is worth noting, however, that even though both Justin and the Alexander Romance mention Alexander dueling Porus, both sources record the battle as a victory for Alexander, and also add the incorrect but often overlooked detail that Alexander killed Porus during the battle. What this means is that those who cite the sources that claim Porus dueled Alexander personally are also, though they often do not realize it, citing the same sources that say Alexander killed Porus on the battlefield all of which is false. The other claims are equally easily disproved. While Greek and Roman sources are indeed the only extant sources for the battle, they are unanimous in recording that Alexander won. In comparison, we have no Persian sources for the Battle of Granicus, but such a lack of sources does not count as evidence that the battle was lost. Moreover, almost all of Roman history, such as the Punic or Gallic Wars, is only recorded in Roman sources, but it would be utterly absurd to argue that there is therefore reason to think that Hannibal won at Zama or Vercingetorix at Alessia. Alexander keeping Porus as king aligns with Alexander's prior treatment of captured rulers and nobility. Mithrenes, Mazaeus, Erasmes, Pratophernes, and Oxyates are all examples of men who directly fought against Alexander, but later surrendered and were either appointed to their previous positions or promoted. As for the death of Bucephalus, Although it highlights how hard fought the battle was, the death of a steed says nothing about the fate of the rider, nor the conclusion of the battle. Alexander's Indian campaign did not stop after the Hadaspes, and he was able to push further into the subcontinent, further evidencing his victory. Porus was, by all accounts, a talented ruler and brave warrior, worthy of respect and admiration for the feats he really did perform, without needing exaggeration. Claims that Alexander lost the battle are not supported by any academic historian or classicist and should be labelled what they are, poor history at best, rank propaganda at worst. Following the battle, Alexander advanced beyond the Hydaspes, accepting the surrender of numerous kings in the area, including Abyssaris, giving much of their lands to Porus to govern as a vassal or satrap. The majority of the local peoples submitted to Alexander, but some, notably the Cathaeans, Oxidracians, and Malians, resisted. After resting his army in Porus's lands, Alexander marched on the Cathian capital of Sangala, alongside Porus and 5,000 of his men. After three days' march, Alexander arrived near the city, finding their army, at least 20,000 strong, stationed outside the city on a hill, surrounded by three makeshift walls of wagons. Alexander led the first wave of the attack, dismounted, and fought alongside his companions. They were able to overcome the first line of defences relatively easily, but the second proved much more difficult. Eventually though, Alexander's army was able to break through the defences, forcing the Cathayans to retreat into their city. The city proved to be too large for Alexander to completely encircle, instead deciding to assault the walls with siege towers. The fighting proved to be particularly difficult, with Alexander losing as many as 1,200 men dead or wounded but he was ultimately successful. Alexander reportedly took 70,000 Cathayans as prisoners and raised Sangala to the ground, possibly as revenge for the comparatively heavy casualties he sustained. For weeks, Alexander's army continued their march inland, suffering from various tropical diseases, snake bites, and other dangers, heading for the Hyphasis River. Beyond this river, Alexander had heard reports of nations such as the Nanda Empire, which had fertile lands and large populations, and were to be the target of Alexander's next phase of his campaign. He had been warned that these nations had colossal armies, 
totaling in the hundreds of thousands, as well as thousands of elephants. But Alexander was nevertheless determined to press on, confident that he and his army would be able to overcome them. Alexander, however, had made a mistake. He had misjudged the attitude of his army. At the Hyphasis River, they mutinied, refusing to march any further. It was not the first time that his men had shown signs of fatigue. Similar concerns had been voiced following the death of Darius, but this was the first time they had point-blank refused to go on. Alexander appealed to them, assuring them that the rumours they had heard regarding the Nanda armies were surely exaggerations. He listed the nations that he and his army had conquered, imploring men to press on further to complete his grand strategy of conquering all of Asia, saying, Glorious are the deeds of those who undergo labour and run the risk of danger, and it is delightful to live a life of valour and to die leaving behind a mortal glory. The speech was met with silence. Alexander encouraged any man to speak their mind, saying that anyone who disagreed could feel free to say so. Still, there was silence. Alexander had always been loved by his army, but the fate of Cletus and Callisthenes, who had both spoken out against Alexander, was perhaps still too close a memory. Alexander grew angry and annoyed, declaring, Alone I shall persist in going on. Expose me to the rivers, the beasts, and those nations whose mere names you dread. I shall find men to follow me, deserted though I am by you. Go then back to your homes. Go in triumph after having abandoned your king. Here I shall find the victory of which you despair, or the opportunity for an honourable death. Some of his men began to break down in tears upon hearing this, but still no one said a word. Finally, Coenus, one of Alexander's finest generals, who had recently distinguished himself at the Hedaspes, spoke up for the men. He firstly assured Alexander that he and the men would, in his words, Go wherever you order, to fight, to incur danger, at the price of our blood, to hand your name to future generations. If you persist, we, even unarmed, naked and worn out, will follow wherever you desire. Coenus then pointed out, however, that after years of campaigning, their armour and weapons were broken and tattered, and that many were now past their fighting prime. They had lost thousands of comrades over the years, some to battles, some to disease, some to the weather or wild animals. Those that were left, Coenus argued, had earned the right to return home and enjoy the glory and riches that Alexander had brought them. Coenus continued, pointing out that Alexander had already won eternal glory and that he risked losing it all if he pushed on with an army that was starting to weaken. It would be wiser, he reasoned, for Alexander to return to Macedonia, rest his men, and then return to the subcontinent for a new campaign with a fresh army. Coenus's speech was greeted with applause and cheers from the men. Furious, Alexander dismissed them and stormed off to his tent. He remained there for two days, hoping that the men's attitude would change. On the third, when it became apparent that they would not relent, Alexander emerged from his tent to perform his regular sacrifices. He proclaimed them to be unfavourable, saying it was a clear message from the gods, and that as a result, he would lead the men home. It was clearly a face-saving act from Alexander, designed to give him an excuse to agree to the men's demands without admitting defeat. But none cared. His men were overjoyed, greeting Alexander with tears and praises, and the latter reconciled with the army. To mark the extent of his campaign, Alexander ordered the construction of twelve large altars, one for each of the Olympian gods. Alexander's campaign, originating in Greece ten years earlier, finally reached its limit at the Hyphasis River in Punjab. Alexander had, in Arian's opinion, finally allowed himself to be defeated, not by an enemy but by his own men. Alexander turned his army around and began the march back to the Hadaspes River. Shortly after this, Coenus died. Most sources say it was an illness that killed him, and no source makes any implication that Alexander was involved. Some modern historians, notably Worthington, do however consider it suspicious that Coenus died so soon after publicly disagreeing with Alexander, and suggest that Alexander may have had him killed, as he had likely done with Callisthenes. Nevertheless, the army soon reached the Hydaspes, where a large fleet had been constructed to sail Alexander's army down the river in preparation for the journey home. 
However, although Alexander's campaign had reached its greatest eastern extent, it was not yet over. The Malians and Oxidracians, who had previously resisted Alexander, inhabited land along the banks of the Hydaspes, and so long as Alexander had an army, there would always be more conquests. After the mutiny, Alexander marched his force back to the Hydaspes, rejoining Craterus, who had been left behind with a portion of the army to construct a fleet. In the few months that Alexander had been away, Craterus and his men had been remarkably productive, managing to construct 38 galleys, as well as hundreds of smaller vessels, numbering as many as one or two thousand according to some ancient sources. At this same time, Alexander also received fresh men, likely from Greece, Babylon and Thrace, consisting of 30,000 infantry and 6,000 cavalry, along with 25,000 new suits of armour and medical supplies, all of which were badly needed. With his army refreshed and resupplied, Alexander began his voyage. Nearchus, his childhood friend, would command the armada, which would also carry Alexander, the Hypaspists, archers and companions. Craterus, meanwhile, was given command of part of the infantry and cavalry on the left bank, while Hephaestion commanded the rest of the force on the right bank. Both would march along the river in tandem with the fleet, acting as scouts and clearing any potential enemies. Alexander's division of his forces like this also served another purpose, however. Throughout his campaigns, court politics had become a bigger and bigger issue, with various generals beginning to feud with one another. Hephaestion and Craterus were two particularly noteworthy examples of this. Hephaestion enjoyed a particularly close relationship with Alexander, and as the campaign continued, he was entrusted with more and more responsibilities, consistently demonstrating himself to be a loyal and competent subordinate and a talented cavalry commander. Craterus was also greatly prized by Alexander, and throughout his campaign, Alexander regularly chose Craterus to be his primary defensive general, often entrusted with holding crucial strongpoints, such as the camp at the Hydaspes. The rivalry between Hephaestion and Craterus was well known, and at one point, they had actually drawn swords against each other over a dispute regarding Alexander's Persianization, forcing Alexander to intervene personally. Alexander's division of his forces while sailing the Hydaspes was therefore not only a strategic decision, but also a shrewd move to separate the two feuding commanders. The army organized accordingly, Alexander set sail, making for the lands of the Oxidracians and Malians, two people who had not yet paid tribute to him, and were rumoured to be preparing for war. As the army moved down the Hydaspes and Akasenes rivers, they received the submission or surrender of a number of local tribes and cities, such as the Sibians, the majority not putting up a fight. When a tribe refused to submit, Alexander would disembark and gather his forces to storm their city. One such tribe was the Agalaseus, who put up fierce resistance, the resulting battle ending in the burning of their city, either accidentally or on Alexander's orders, before being conquered. There were other dangers besides these pockets of resistance. At the confluence of the Indus and the Akasenes, the fast-flowing rivers wreaked havoc amongst his fleet, some ships smashing together and Alexander losing two of the larger ones. At one point, according to some sources, Alexander's own ship almost succumbed to the torrents, forcing him to strip off his armour and dive into the water in order to swim to safety. Despite these dangers, the majority of the fleet and the army successfully reached Malian territory sometime in late 326 BC. The Malians and Oxidracians were traditionally enemies, but upon hearing of Alexander's planned approach, they had formed an alliance in order to stop the invader. However, Alexander's rapid advance down the river meant that his enemies had not been able to properly combine their forces. As a result, Alexander decided on a blitzkrieg-esque strategy to quickly conquer the Malians before the two forces could unite. To achieve this, he split his army into a number of parts. Alexander, with approximately 6,500 infantry, including the Hypaspists, archers and Agrianians, and 2,000 cavalry of companions and horse archers, was to attack from the north. Craterus would advance down the west bank of the river, while Hephaestion would march quickly down the east bank. Ptolemy was given another detachment and ordered to wait three days before advancing, while Nearchus would sail down the river to the borders of Malian territory. 
With this strategy, Alexander planned to take the Malians by surprise, attacking from multiple directions and forcing them to either retreat deeper into their territory, where they would be caught by Hephaestion's force or Nearchus's fleet, or forced to flee north, where Ptolemy would intercept them. It was an excellent example of how Alexander was not only a gifted tactician, but also a talented strategist. Nevertheless, his men were initially and understandably reluctant. Alexander had promised them that they would be returning home, but rather than halting his campaign, Alexander had simply diverted the campaign in a different direction. There was once again talk of mutiny, but Alexander was, on this occasion, able to quickly subdue the problem. He reassured the men that this campaign would be swift and straightforward, but still with the promise of plenty of glory and plunder, and that the ocean, the current aim of Alexander's ambition, was close. His men's grievances handled, the campaign began. It was a quick affair, Alexander marching 50 miles in just under two days and subduing all the Malian towns west of the Hydraortes in just seven days. However, it was also as ruthless as it was quick, Alexander's men killing any who resisted, including holy Brahmins. Perdiccas, with cavalry and light infantry, was dispatched from Alexander's force and sent to subdue other cities and chase down any fugitives to stop word of Alexander's advance spreading. The other portions of Alexander's army had been just as ruthlessly efficient, forcing many Malians to retreat to their capital. Leading expert on the history of ancient Macedonia, Albert Bosworth, described it as a conquest through terror, and although it is possible to explain Alexander's tactics as a grim necessity in order to end the campaign quickly and decisively, motivated by the men's recent talks of mutiny and the need to secure supply lines, it is also impossible to avoid the reality that the Malian campaign was one of Alexander's most brutal. The strategy had nevertheless been successful in conquering much of the Malian territory, and Alexander now gathered his force to march on their capital. Initially, it seemed as if it would fall as quickly as many other places had to Alexander's army, his men quickly seizing the city. However, the attack stalled when the men tried to breach the citadel. To inspire his men to continue the attack and keep up the momentum, Alexander scaled a siege ladder himself, mounting the battlements. His men were invigorated by this display of bravery, the hypaspists swarming the ladders behind him. However, under the weight of so many men, the ladders broke, leaving Alexander stranded on the battlements with only Leonatus, one of his seven personal bodyguards, and Pecestus and Abraeus, two officers who had previously distinguished themselves in battle. Alexander quickly realized they would be easy targets for archers inside if they stayed atop the battlements and were in mortal danger. Determined to die fighting, Alexander jumped from the battlements into the citadel, closely followed by the others. Fierce fighting broke out when a group of the Malians realized that they had Alexander himself trapped and attempted to swarm the four. It was a desperate affair, Alexander fighting with his back to a tree, the four men attempting to fend off any attackers that came close. Abraeus was cut down in the fighting, leaving only Leonatus and Pecestus carrying the shield of Achilles to protect Alexander. In the chaotic fighting, a Malian archer managed to shoot Alexander, the arrow piercing his ribs and probably puncturing a lung. Alexander was forced to his knees, coughing up blood. <coughs> Bucestus placed the shield of Achilles over Alexander to protect his body, and together with Leonatus, prepared to defend him to the last. The rest of Alexander's army had, fortunately, not been idle. As soon as they had seen their king jump from the battlements, they had been seized by a kind of desperate frenzy, launching themselves at the citadel's gates. Smashing their way through, they fought their way through the defenders to search for Alexander. Upon seeing his body in a pool of blood, they lost all control, massacring any Malians left in the city in revenge, including women and children. With the city taken, Alexander was taken from the battlefield for surgery to remove the arrow. Due to the arrow being barbed, it required a deep incision to be made to pull it out, and the combined blood loss of the initial wound and the operation almost killed Alexander. He did, however, survive, but spent days almost completely bedridden, and it is still debated whether he ever completely recovered from the wound. It had been a remarkable display of Alexander's bravery or foolhardiness, depending on opinion. 
While the sources do disagree on the names of some of the individuals involved, Pukestus' involvement is certain and common across all the sources. In recognition for his bravery, Alexander expanded the ranks of his personal bodyguard to eight in order to incorporate him, and he would later ensure that Pukestus was assigned one of the richest provinces of the empire. Among the rank-and-file soldiers, rumor had spread that Alexander had died. Some were worried about who would command the army in his absence, others doubting whether they would be able to make it home without him. On numerous occasions, the generals tried to reassure the men, and Alexander even wrote a letter to be dispersed among his men, but they refused to believe any of it. Alexander instead ordered that he be taken by ship past the camp at such a distance that they would recognize him but not close enough that they could see how weak he currently was. A wave from his hand was enough to calm the men. His generals, however, are said to have been relieved about his recovery, but also rather critical of Alexander, reprimanding him for being so reckless, lamenting the fact that he almost died taking, in the grand scheme of things, a rather nondescript city thousands of miles from home while still so young, and urging him to stay out of the fighting more in the future. Alexander thanked them for their concern, but claimed that he measured his life not in years, but in victories, saying, I am bound to desire an abundant life rather than a long one. I will meet, unterrified, the hazards of war and Ares. In approximately spring of 325, after spending weeks recovering, Alexander was eventually well enough to travel again. In the time that he'd spent recovering, Word of the Malian defeat had reached the Oxidracians, who quickly submitted without fighting as a result. Alexander's Blitzkrieg strategy had proved to be a complete success. With the two peoples subdued, Alexander and his army once again journeyed down the Acacines and Indus, aiming for the ocean. Many of the cities en route submitted passively, Alexander only facing light resistance for the most part. However, in many of these cities that did submit, the Brahmins, who were advisors as well as religious figures, often stirred dissent and rebellions behind Alexander, forcing him to send men back to crush the revolts and execute the Brahmins. It would not be the last time that these holy men would prove a problem for him. Upon reaching Patala, Alexander sent many of the older veterans as well as roughly 4,500 other men with Craterus to Kamania through Aracosia the first stage of those veterans' long journey home to Macedonia. After resting the remainder of his men at Patala for a time, Alexander planned the final stage of his voyage. The Indus at this point split into two arms, Alexander choosing to sail down the west. Strong winds, however, damaged many ships, forcing him to return. He was undaunted, however, and when better weather arrived, Alexander once again tried the passage and, having spent roughly seven months sailing down the Hydaspes, finally achieved his long-held dream of reaching the ocean. Barely ten years ago, he had been fighting small tribes around Illyria and contesting with rival claimants to the throne of Macedonia. Now he stood on the coast of the Indian Ocean, with all the lands between him and his homeland conquered. He was only 31 years old. Alexander sailed briefly in the waters of the ocean, making sacrifices and leaving altars on a small island that would mark the furthest southern point of his empire. He then began to lay plans for a massive exploratory effort, charging Nearchus with leading the fleet into the Persian Gulf and mapping the coast before sailing up the Euphrates to Babylon. Alexander, meanwhile, took his force to the Arabius River and the land of the Eritians, splitting his army once more into three parts to quickly capture the region and leaving Leonatus and a portion of his army to control the area. In the autumn of 325, Alexander led the rest of his army and a baggage train into the territory of the Gedrosians, aiming to hug the coast and dig wells and leave supplies for Nearchus's fleet. It would prove to be the biggest mistake of Alexander's career. Scouting parties soon reported to Alexander that there was no drinking water along the coast, forcing Alexander to take a shorter, more direct road inland through the Gedrosian Desert, aiming for the city of Pura. The result was a march of roughly 450 miles. The scorching temperatures in the day forced the army to march largely throughout the night, slowing progress down massively. When their supplies ran out, 
The army tried to eat the roots of palm trees and killed what pack animals they had for food. As a result of this, however, they were unable to carry their sick or wounded, and men that fell behind were left to die of thirst, starvation or exposure. On the rare occasions that the army could find water, many men, unable to restrain themselves, drank too much too fast, dying from water intoxication. On one particular occasion, when the army was encamped near a small brook, a flash flood struck, carrying away men, baggage and camp followers. These factors forced Alexander to move his army to always encamp a certain distance away from water when it was found, putting even more strain on the already deteriorating force. For 60 days the army suffered through the desert, before finally reaching the safety of Pura, where they could rest and recuperate. There are a few points regarding Alexander's march through the Gedrosian desert which are worth discussing. Firstly, Nearchus would later write that Alexander had chosen to march through the desert to try and outdo the Assyrian queen, Semiramis, and Persian Cyrus the Great, both of whom had supposedly crossed the desert, emerging with only a fraction of their force intact. Arian is quick to note, however, that it is Nearchus alone who makes this claim. It would not have been the first time that Alexander had seemingly been motivated by a desire to outdo previous great rulers and this could well have been a factor in his consideration. But the route Alexander planned did also have, at least initially, a strategic purpose in resupplying the fleet. It seems likely, based on Alexander's need to send scouting parties to look for water by the coast, that he was ignorant of the territory, and that his march was thus a genuine strategic blunder, rather than being a result of purely selfish motivations. Second is the idea that Alexander was attempting to punish his men for mutinying at the Hephasis by taking them through a particularly torturous route. This is a particularly cynical interpretation that has a number of glaring problems. The mutiny had happened months earlier, and though Alexander could certainly hold a grudge, one wonders why he waited so long to punish the men. We also have other examples of Alexander punishing mutineers, and he did so by executing ringleaders, rather than punishing the entire army. Moreover, Alexander himself, as well as close friends and companions, suffered all the same hardships as the army. He personally led scouting missions, and in one particularly famous anecdote, when Alexander's men had gone to great difficulty to bring him water, he thanked them, but then poured it away, refusing to drink unless all his men could. Whether this particular anecdote is true or not can be debated, but what cannot be debated is that Alexander was putting himself in as much danger as his men. Lastly, the sources are clear that Alexander did not have his full army with him. Part of the force had been left in Aura with Leonatus, while yet another significant portion, notably with many veterans, had been sent on an alternative route under Craterus's command. It was the veterans who had been the core of the mutiny at the Hephasis, and so these movements make no sense if one assumes Alexander was attempting to punish the men. The final point to address is the number of men that Alexander lost. Plutarch, the only source to provide any kind of figure, claims that Alexander lost as much as three quarters of his entire army. Plutarch, by his own admission, however, was not a historian, and his figures are often some of the most exaggerated in the available sources. Moreover, as we have seen, Alexander did not take his full force into Gudrasia. He took a portion, possibly as many as 30 to 40,000, according to modern estimates. Much of the rest of Alexander's army was sent via the other route under Craterus, or left as garrison forces in conquered regions, such as that under Leonatus. It is also hard to discern how many deaths were sustained by Alexander's military forces, and how many were camp followers. Modern historians continue to debate what the most likely figure is, and as of yet there is no consensus on the matter. What does seem apparent is that Alexander lost more men marching through the desert than in any of his battles, and so at the very least, his losses were likely in the thousands. Whatever the true number, Alexander's decision to march through the desert is widely regarded as his greatest strategic mistake. Alexander's arrival at Pura effectively marked the end of his Indian campaign. It had been a series of low and high points in his career. On the one hand, the campaign had stretched his men's morale almost to breaking point at the Hephasis, had used some particularly brutal tactics, 
had resulted in the deaths of potentially thousands of men marching through the Gadrosian desert, and had resulted in a wound that had almost killed Alexander, and may well have been a contributing factor to his early death. Furthermore, the Brahmins, a constant thorn in Alexander's side, continued to lead revolts throughout territories taken by Alexander, ultimately resulting in many of them being abandoned by Hellenic forces over the next few years and decades, before being absorbed into the Mauryan Empire under Chandragupta. On the other hand, Alexander achieved, arguably, his most impressive military victory at the Hadaspes, had shown his incredible strategic talent during the Malian campaign, taking the empire to its greatest extent, completed his lifelong dream of reaching the ocean, and opened up the Indian subcontinent to the Hellenic world, an achievement that would have deep and far-reaching implications. Nearing the end of 325 BC, after having crossed the dangerous Gedrosian desert, Alexander allowed his men to rest a while in Pura. While there, he received reports on the performance of many of his satraps. To his anger, many of them had taken advantage of his prolonged campaign in the Indian subcontinent, becoming corrupt and disobedient. Moreover, some had taken to looting local temples and tombs, and there were hundreds of cases of his men raping local women. Alexander, eager to be considered a benevolent ruler rather than a conqueror, had such men executed, satrap and rank and file alike, appointing hand-picked governors where necessary. More worryingly still, Alexander had been brought reports that back in Europe, serious divisions had begun to form between Antipater, who Alexander had left in command of the region, and Olympias and Cleopatra, Alexander's mother and sister respectively. Though Alexander could have no way of knowing it, this rift would, in the long term, prove to be disastrous for his empire. Around the same time, Alexander proclaimed his so-called Dissolution Decree, which ordered all mercenaries his satraps and generals hired to disband. He was likely motivated by the worry that corruption and disobedience may eventually develop into complete rebellion, but the decree would soon prove to have been rather short-sighted. Though many mercenaries were shipped to Greece, many were also left roaming the empire, well-armed and unpaid, a problem Alexander would later have to address. Upon leaving Pura, Alexander and his army made for Kamania. According to some sources, he turned the seven-day march into a kind of Dionysiac celebration, his men drinking and dancing as they marched. Alexander himself dressed as Dionysus atop a makeshift chariot. Arian, who often takes a more favourable view of Alexander, doubts the veracity of this story, while Rufus, who rarely missed a chance to indulge in such anecdotes, wrote, A mere 1,000 men, if sober, could have captured this group on its triumphal march. The truth of the tale can be debated, however, the story does touch on an undebatable detail. As the campaign continued, Alexander more and more closely linked himself with the gods. Though Arian had doubts regarding this particular episode, there were many other occasions where Alexander either dressed or styled himself as a deity. For some in his army, this was palatable or even welcomed, and his Persian subjects, who had always viewed their king as a divine being, saw no issue with it. However, the others in the army, likely the older men who had fought alongside him for years, were growing increasingly frustrated with it, a division that would soon come to a head. Alexander and his force reached Salamis, the capital of Carmania, sometime in the winter of 325. While there, Nearchus joined Alexander, successfully returning from his 60-day voyage across the Makran coast. Yet another celebration was held, with Nearchus regaling an enthralled Alexander with tales of his journey and the people and creatures that he encountered. Though this expedition had been largely exploratory, it had also served another purpose of being a training exercise. Alexander was already developing plans for his next great campaign. Nearchus's fleet managing to sustain themselves without needing an accompanying land army would be a crucial factor in these strategies. After resting in Salamis, Nearchus was once again sent out by Alexander, this time towards the Euphrates and Tigris rivers, where they would begin preparations for the next phase of Alexander's conquests. At the start of 324 BC, Alexander moved to the capital of Persis, Persagade, where he once more decided to visit the tomb of Cyrus the Great. To Alexander's fury, he found the tomb desecrated, with Cyrus's skeleton scattered on the floor. 
Alexander had long considered Cyrus a king worthy of his respect, possibly even an outright inspiration. Outraged, Alexander had the guards of the tomb tortured for information on the perpetrator, but learnt nothing and had the satrap of Persis, Auxanes, executed for negligence. As his replacement, Alexander appointed Pecestus, a man who had fought bravely to protect him in Malia. He also ordered that the tomb be renovated and improved by his chief engineer, and that Cyrus's body be restored with full honours. The army moved on, heading to the old ceremonial capital of Persepolis. Here they once again celebrated with a huge drinking party. According to ancient sources, the Macedonians drank so heavily that no less than 36 men died of alcohol poisoning. The reports of such excessive drinking parties in the sources became more and more regular as Alexander's campaign progressed, particularly in the latter years. Macedonians in general were known to be heavy binge drinkers, but even by their standards, Alexander and his men seemed to have been drinking particularly excessively. It has been suggested that this heavy drinking may have been the result of Alexander struggling with mental illness, possibly PTSD, or simply the massive stress and pressure that he was under for almost his entire life. This would, in all likelihood, prove to be yet another problem, which would soon be tragic for Alexander. Shortly after, Alexander marched his men to Susa, where he undertook several important administrative tasks. As mentioned earlier, Alexander's dissolution decree left many mercenaries roaming his empire and causing trouble. As with the Gordian knot, Alexander used a pragmatic solution to a complicated problem. He issued the Exile Decree, which ordered all Greek exiles, including mercenaries, to return to their home cities except the most serious criminals. Many Greek cities protested this decree, but Alexander made it clear that Antipater had the authority to use force on any who refused to uphold it. While this did help ease the mercenary problem, Alexander also had other motives. Reports from Europe about rumours of dissent among the Greek city-states had concerned Alexander. However, by publishing this decree, Alexander ensured that the polis would have an influx of people, many of whom would have been politicians exiled by their opponents, who would owe him their loyalty thanks to being repatriated. While in Susa, Alexander once again heard reports on the performance of his satraps, executing those who had abused the citizens they were governing, replacing those that were unsatisfactory, and rewarding those who were. Around this time, Alexander carried out the famous Susa weddings. Polygamy was an accepted practice in Macedonian society, and so, despite already being married to Roxana, Alexander married once again, this time to Statera, a daughter of Darius III, while Hephaestion was wedded to another of Darius's daughters. Alexander and Hephaestion had always been close, and this marriage ensured their descendants would now be family. These marriages may also reveal that Alexander was concerned that the governing of some of his satraps had resulted in discontent among the Persian populace, and that he felt a need to strengthen his position. These were not the only marriages, however. Many of Alexander's companions, perhaps as many as 90, were married to powerful Persian women, many of whom would have been linked to the Achaemenid family, all given handsome dowries from Alexander. At the same time, 10,000 of the rank and file who had married Asiatic women were registered and given presents by the king. The marriages of Alexander, Hephaestion and the Companions all took place on the same day in a mass wedding done in the Persian style. Alexander personally paid off the debts of his soldiers, costing him approximately 20,000 talents, according to the ancient sources, worth as much as a staggering $28 billion today. While many were happy to have their debts paid and marriages registered, some, particularly among the companions, were less happy with being effectively forced to marry Persian women. Notably, out of all the future Diadochi of Alexander who were married on this occasion, only one, Seleucus, stayed married to their given wife. Alexander's motive for these marriages has been and is still much debated. On the one hand, some historians, such as Tarn from the 1930s, share the view of Plutarch that Alexander was attempting to unify the two people of Europe and Asia to create a kind of brotherhood of mankind. In this interpretation, 
Alexander hoped to set a precedent of unity, so it was essentially a humanist act. Conversely, more modern historians like Badian and Worthington view these marriages as a purely pragmatic act. Rather than hoping to create a unity of humankind, they argue that Alexander was more concerned with diluting the Persian royal bloodline so that none could proclaim himself as a Persian king. Moreover, in their views, Alexander was hoping that the unions would result in a ruling class of mixed Macedonian-Iranian people who would not be seen as foreign conquerors, making governance easier. There is also a big question of how coerced some of these marriages were. While there may have been some among the companions and their wives who were happy with the marriage, others were likely forced into marriages. The Persian women in particular, though we have no source that gives their views, may have been none too pleased with the idea that they were being married off to men who, no matter how Alexander wished to portray things, were their conquerors. Nevertheless, the Susa wedding and exile decree are important reminders that Alexander was a ruler and politician as well as a military man. In many ways though, his attitude was the same on and off the battlefield. He preferred bold, decisive and high-risk actions. In some cases, such as the exile decree, these decisions appear to show a particular cunning of Alexander, while on the other hand, the Susa marriages arguably show him as being rather naive. In conjunction with these weddings, Alexander undertook the most significant steps towards integrating more Persians into his army. Men from Aracosia, Bactria and Sogdiana were incorporated into the companions, while the royal guard and 30,000 young Persians trained in the Macedonian style were absorbed into the army. Once again, the question of Alexander's motive is debated. Some view it as another attempt to create a unity of nations, while others view it as yet another solely pragmatic step intended to form the base of a new army to replace the many men who had either died, been wounded, or were now too old to fight. Although some of Alexander's army accepted and welcomed these changes, many were frustrated. Alexander's Persianization had been a sticking point for many of his men for years, and this increase of Persians into the army pushed them to their breaking point. Alexander marched his army from Susa into Mesopotamia in the summer of 324. At the Opis River, he announced that as many as 10,000 veterans and wounded would be sent back to Greece with full pay and rich rewards. This seemed a sensible suggestion given the army's previous mutiny at Hephaestus. To Alexander's surprise, however, the men rebelled once again. Frustrated with Alexander's personal Persianization, his divine pretensions, and viewing themselves as being replaced by Persians, the Macedonians demanded that he send them all home and continue with his father Zeusamon and his Persian war dancers. Alexander's reaction to this was far more dramatic than at the Hephaestus. Infuriated, he pointed out 13 men he considered the main agitators and had his hypaspists execute them immediately. He then harshly rebuked the men, listing Philip's achievements, his own, and what they had done for Macedonia. Arian has Alexander saying, The wealth of the Lydians, the treasure of the Persians, and the riches of the Indians are yours, as is the outer sea. You are satraps, generals, and captains. What have I reserved for myself after all these labours, except this purple robe and diadem? Whoever has wounds, let him strip and show them, and I will show you mine in turn. For there is no part of my body, at least on the front, free from wounds. Depart, all of you. Go back and report home that you deserted your king and went away, handing him over to the protection of foreigners. Be gone! As with almost all speeches recorded in ancient sources, it is hard to discern how much of this was Arian's creation or Alexander's actual speech. Nevertheless, other sources, though giving slightly different speeches, all touch on similar themes and it is likely that Alexander truly did feel these sentiments. It is possible to view Alexander's speech as self-aggrandizing, as he lauded his and his father's achievements and tried to shame the men who had helped him achieve such feats by lauding their accomplishments as his alone. However, an argument can also be made that Alexander was justified in what he was saying, even if he was rather arrogant. Alexander was a significant factor in the army's success and he had suffered alongside his men and rewarded them generously. Alexander's frustration at them for not sharing his ambition 
is as understandable as his men's frustration with Alexander for making them feel alienated. As at the Hyphasis, however, his words had little immediate effect on the men, and Alexander stormed into his tent, remaining there for two days. Rather than offering the hand of reconciliation as he had done previously, Alexander doubled down on his position. He replaced senior Macedonian officers with Persians. More Persians were inducted into the most honoured units, including the Companions and Silver Shields. Alexander's stance was clear. His vision of the new Persian Hellenic army was happening, and the men either had to put up with it or leave. Shamed, his men begged him for forgiveness, and Alexander reconciled with them tearfully. Alexander's epic speech has since been lauded as the turning point of the mutiny, but while the speech is inspiring, powerful and beautiful, it was not what convinced the men. It was Alexander's understanding of what kind of pressure he could apply that stopped the mutiny, and crediting the speech alone with Alexander's success underestimates his cunning. Hundreds of years later, and likely inspired by Alexander, Julius Caesar would use a similar tactic against one of his mutinying legions, dismissing them and telling them he would go on without them with similar success. Alexander held a huge feast to celebrate the reconciliation, sitting the Macedonians with the Persians and offering prayers for the unity of the two people. He continued with his original plan, sending approximately 10,000 veterans and wounded back to Macedonia under the command of Craterus. The latter was ordered to replace Antipater as regent of Europe, while the aging Antipater was ordered to join Alexander with a further 10,000 reinforcements. This move would, in theory, give Alexander a reliable and trusted general in Europe, while bringing Antipater, who had been in confrontation with Olympias, closer to Alexander for him to keep an eye on. Neither of these plans, however, would come to fruition. Alexander marched to Ecbatana, where he once again held a large celebration in honour of Dionysus, with much drinking and partying. At this point, in October of 324 BC, Hephaestion developed a fever. Glaucus, his doctor, cared for him, and at first, Hephaestion appeared to be on the mend. However, one day, while feeling better, he drank a large amount of wine and fell severely ill once again. Alexander was summoned and immediately rushed to his companion's side, but by the time he got there, Hephaestion was already dead. Hephaestion had been one of Alexander's closest friends, and the two men had known each other since boyhood, and some speculate had even been lovers. The truth in the latter claim can be debated, but it is undoubtedly true that the two men were very close. Hephaestion had fought alongside Alexander for years, mainly as the commander of his seven-man bodyguard, and was one of Alexander's most dependable subordinates. He was often entrusted with delicate diplomatic missions, as well as his military duties, and eventually effectively became Alexander's right-hand man. Hephaestion, because of his closeness to Alexander, seems to have made many of Alexander's other commanders somewhat jealous, so it is unlikely that they were moved by his death. Alexander, on the other hand, was devastated. There are many versions of what Alexander did in the immediate aftermath. Some say that he immediately had Glaucus, Hephaestion's doctor, executed, that Alexander lay crying on Hephaestion's body throughout the night, that he decreed Hephaestion should be honoured as a hero with sacrifices and more. Arian, who reports many of these stories, admits he is unsure which are true and which are not. He is right to be cautious. Many historians in ancient times were moralists who viewed their subjects as moral exemplar. As a result, some may have exaggerated Alexander's grief to highlight his humanity, others to highlight his lack of restraint. Nevertheless, Arian does say that all sources he came across agreed that Alexander refused to eat for three days and ordered days of public mourning and a funeral costing thousands of talents. The exact manner in which Alexander showed his grief can be disputed, but the extent of that grief cannot be. He was truly heartbroken. After weeks of depression, his companions managed to coax him back into action, and Alexander conducted a brief expedition against the Cossians, a small mountain tribe that was quickly overwhelmed. This brief footnote in his career would prove to be his last military action. He marched his army to Babylon, where he planned to oversee preparations for the next campaign. 
The sources of Alexander report a number of mysterious and fantastical omens while he was en route to the city. A group of Chaldean philosophers begged him not to enter the city, prophesying that he would die if he did. Crows had fallen dead at his feet while he walked, and when he was sailing the marshes around Babylon, a branch caught his diadem, leaving him crownless. Most ominously of all for Alexander and his companions, after they had been exercising and Alexander returned to the throne room, he found a strange man sitting on the throne in full royal regalia. When the man was questioned, he simply replied that he had done so because the gods commanded him. Omens like this obviously lack historical reliability, but they give an important insight into the mentality of ancient peoples. The gods had already decided that Alexander's end was near. All of the relevant sources broadly agree upon Alexander's movements up until the 31st of May 323 BC. Having been hounded by ominous omens, Alexander arrived in Babylon, where he would finalize preparations for an invasion of Arabia, particularly the construction of a new harbor to hold the newly made coastal fleet that Nearchus would command. Alexander spent his days overseeing these preparations, touring the marshes and rivers around the city, and relaxing with his companions. However, as the sources near his final weeks, the narrative splits between the surviving sources that use the royal diaries and those that use the so-called pamphlet. The royal diaries give a day-by-day -day account of Alexander's movement, and were in turn reported by Arian and Plutarch. On the 31st of May, Alexander celebrated a sacrifice to Dionysus, eating with friends and drinking late into the night. Alexander then left to turn in, but one of his companions, Medius, convinced him to come to a drinking party at his house. Alexander and the guests all drank heavily throughout the night. The next day, on the 1st of June, Alexander had a raging fever and slept in the bathhouse. The following day, he bathed and spent the day playing dice and drinking with Medius, and went to bed feverish throughout the night. On the 3rd of June, he was carried on a couch to perform his daily sacrifices, gave instructions to his officers about the upcoming Arabian expedition, and was moved to a cooler palace where he bathed and rested. The following day followed the same routine, Alexander giving some instructions, bathing and resting but his fever became noticeably more severe by night. He continued this routine from the 5th to the 8th, his fever growing worse and worse. By this point, Alexander was terribly weak, unable to speak, barely able to move, and propped up by a pillow. Some of his companions were sent to the Temple of Serapis to ask the god what should be done, and they were told to leave Alexander as he was. Around this time, his soldiers began to become seriously worried about him, demanding that they be allowed to see him. Initially, Alexander's generals and bodyguards tried to prevent them from seeing him, but the soldiers grew increasingly angry, threatening to force their way into his chambers if necessary. The men and Alexander had feuded, but they had nonetheless spent 12 years fighting alongside each other. Alexander owed everything to them, as they owed everything to him. Some of these soldiers would have served under Philip, and would have known Alexander since he was a young man who commanded the flank at Cyrenea and watched him develop from a boy to a man. For others, he would have been the only king they knew, nearer a god than a man, a figure who had led them against countless enemies and always proved victorious. Alexander's inner circle relented, and the men were allowed to see him. As they filed past him, Alexander, who had led the charges at Granicus, Issus and Gorgamella, who had crossed mountains and deserts with them, could do little more than weakly raise a hand in recognition. By the 11th, Alexander was dead, his last words supposedly leaving his empire, quote, to the strongest. Arian and Plutarch, who report this version of events, both refer to rumors that Alexander was poisoned, but are clear that they consider this to be only a rumor and that he died of natural causes. The account of Alexander's death in the pamphlet, reported in the so-called Alexander Romance, is markedly different, going into detail about the alleged poisoning mentioned by Arian and Plutarch. According to this account, Antipater, Alexander's general governing Macedonia, had become fearful of Alexander, partly because of a rift that had developed between him and Alexander's mother, Olympias, and partially because he had been summoned to Babylon to meet Alexander. Fearing that he was to be punished or removed from power, 
Antipater had his son, Cassander, smuggle poison to Babylon. Once there, Cassander's brother Iolas, who was also Alexander's cupbearer, would use it to assassinate the king. As in the royal diaries, Alexander celebrates a sacrifice to Dionysus and leaves for bed, but is convinced to stay out drinking by Medius. The pamphlet claims that there were 20 other people at this drinking party. They were Perdiccas, Meliega, Python, Leonatus, Cassander, Pucestus, Ptolemy, Lysimachus, Eumenes, Nearchus, Philip the Doctor, Philip the Engineer, Stasenor, Olchius, Heraclides, Philotas, Meander, Asander, Ariston, and Iolas. Another source also adds that Proteus, a cousin of Cletus the Black, was present. The pamphlet then claims that only Perdiccas, Ptolemy, Olchius, Lysimachus, Eumenes, and Asander were innocent, and that all the rest knew what was going to happen next. Iolas gave Alexander a poisoned drink the others talking amongst themselves while it took effect. Alexander then cried loudly and had severe abdominal pains, but soon managed to compose himself and urged the others to continue drinking. He, in the meantime, requested a feather to make himself vomit. Iolas provided one coated with more of the poison. This caused Alexander more pain, sending him into spasms, and he suffered throughout the night. He spent the next day in pain, and the day after, he began writing his will with the help of Ptolemy, Perdiccas, and Lysimachus. Ptolemy and Perdiccas, both wary of each other, pledged that if either of them were made the executor of the will, they would split Alexander's possessions between them. The following day, Alexander's soldiers threatened to kill Alexander's bodyguards if they were not allowed to see their king, and they were allowed to file past and see Alexander, who was by this point very weak. The pamphlet then gives a supposed account of Alexander's will. In it, Alexander entrusts his body and the preparation of it to Egyptian priests, with Perdiccas being named the guardian of it. Alexander then requested that Thebes be rebuilt, including generous gifts to the city to help it prosper again, and names Craterus as the regent of Macedonia, Ptolemy the governor of Egypt, and Asia to Perdiccas and Antigonus. Philip Arhideus, Alexander's brother, is then named King of Macedonia until Alexander's child with Roxana is born. If it is a boy, then he shall be king. If it's a girl, then the Macedonians can choose whether they want to keep Philip or appoint someone else as king. The will then almost completely contradicts this soon after. Ptolemy is named the satrap of Libya, Perdiccas of Egypt, and Pamphylia and Cilicia to Antigonus. A number of the other assigned satraps are also named. Thrace to Lysimachus, the Hellespont to Leonatus, Paphlagonia and Cappadocia to Eumenes, the Islanders to Rhodes, Babylon to Seleucus, Phoenicia and Syria to Meliagar. Perdiccas was then apparently given Alexander's signet ring, and Alexander is asked who he leaves his kingdom to, and he does not mention his brother or child, and instead replies, to the strongest. These obvious contradictions in the will, as given by the pamphlet, clearly show that it was revised and edited at some point in history. While there are some similarities between the two sources, for instance that Alexander's health declined shortly after a drinking party hosted by Medius and that he died days later, there are far more differences. The royal diaries makes no mention of the names of those who attended the drinking party, poison, abdominal pains, spasms, or a will, and gives no indication of Alexander naming any subsequent satraps. Similarly, the pamphlet does not reference a fever, Alexander's bathing, his conferences with his officers, or the Temple of Serapis. Therefore, we are left with two conflicting narratives, which give remarkably different accounts of Alexander's last days. Moreover, through source analysis, both of these chronologies have been determined to have originated shortly after the death of Alexander. In short, this means that two narratives emerged soon after Alexander's death, the version given by the royal diaries that he died of natural causes, and the version given by the pamphlet that he was poisoned. Furthermore, both versions have signs that indicate they were written with an agenda in mind. The royal diaries, for instance, are remarkably detailed and meticulous. It is therefore surprising that this is one of the only times they are referenced in our sources, and some modern historians have speculated that they were created specifically to provide a controlled, official narrative of Alexander's last days. 
On the other hand, the pamphlet is suspicious for how definitively it names those who were guilty and innocent of Alexander's death, and the various contradictions in Alexander's will. Both these points suggest that the pamphlet may have been written by someone who wanted to advance their political position by associating their rivals with Alexander's death and legitimizing their claims through Alexander's will. It is firstly important to discuss the primary sources of Alexander's death, the royal diaries, which are recounted in both Plutarch and Arian, and the pamphlet, as given in the Alexander Romance. The royal diaries were written sometime shortly after Alexander's death, either in the months following it, or no more than 25 years later. These diaries were likely used by various historians in the years following Alexander's death, such as Ptolemy and Cletarchus, and from there were used by Arian and Plutarch. Both of these later authors attribute the diaries to Eumenes of Caria, Alexander's royal secretary, and Diodotus, who were contemporaries and, certainly in the case of Eumenes, would have been a direct eyewitness to the events. Some modern historians question the authorship of the diaries, but all agree that whoever did write them was someone who was in Babylon with Alexander when he died. The Alexander Romance is even more complex. When the original text was written is unknown, some suggesting it was sometime in the 3rd century BC, others suggesting the 4th century AD. What is known, however, is that over the centuries it was widely read, translated and amended. Much like folk tales, the Alexander Romance evolved over time, incorporating different themes and stories, so it is largely considered an unreliable source, bordering on historical fiction, with parts of the text claiming that Alexander had sharp fangs and that Bucephalus was a violent, man-eating horse. Nevertheless, just as even the most reliable ancient histories often contain incredulous and fanciful episodes, the most unreliable sources can contain nuggets of historical truth. The section of the Alexander Romance that covers Alexander's death is considered by some modern historians to be one such example. This section is often called either the Liber de Morte or simply the pamphlet. Its tone and content are markedly different from the rest of the Alexander Romance, and passages from this section have been found in papyri dating from at least the first century. This section then likely would have been available to later Roman historians, and was certainly not one of the many embellishments added centuries later. Moreover, numerous context clues make it clear that this portion was written in the decades immediately following Alexander's death. Therefore, many modern scholars conclude that shortly after Alexander's death, a pamphlet was written detailing the events surrounding it. This pamphlet was widely distributed, enough for Roman historians to use it, and eventually became incorporated into the Alexander Romance. Some details are given in other works, but it was the royal diaries and pamphlet that were the main sources used by the surviving Alexander historians, Plutarch, Diodorus, Arian, Rufus and Justin, either directly or indirectly. These then are the sources upon which all theories regarding the death of Alexander are built upon. Proponents of the idea that Alexander died of natural causes, whatever those precise causes may be, ultimately rely upon the royal diaries. On the face of it, the diaries seem to be an excellent and first-rate source. All agree that they were written by an eyewitness, most probably Alexander's secretary Eumenes, shortly after his death. Moreover, they are incredibly detailed for an ancient source, giving a day-by-day -day account of Alexander's final weeks, and meticulously noting every bath and meal he took. They are also written in a very unrhetorical style, focusing almost entirely upon events, with little emotive language. Finally, the claim that they make, that Alexander died of natural causes after drinking a large amount of wine, is entirely reasonable. It is a fact that Alexander, and aristocratic Macedonians in general, did indulge in extensive binge drinking sessions to scales that can be fatal. Moreover, Alexander had also recently been in areas known even in ancient times to have been malaria-ridden, such as the marshes around Babylon. Couple these points with the fact that Alexander had suffered several serious wounds throughout his lifetime, most recently including a near-fatal lung wound during the Malian campaign, 
and death by natural causes is well within reason. However, skeptics of the royal diaries would point to several inconsistencies or perceived anachronistic details within them. Though the detailed day-by-day -day account of the diaries may seem to imply their accuracy, some argue that it in fact shows the very opposite and that the painstaking level of detail is deliberately intended to leave no possibility for Alexander's poisoning. In other words, they may be a cover-up. It is also worth pointing out that the royal diaries are not referred to in any other part of Arian and Plutarch. If the diaries were so detailed, why were they not cited more often by these later authors? It is also important to bear in mind that Plutarch and Arian would not have been using the diaries directly, but instead using sources that were in turn relying upon the diaries. However, there would still surely be more references to the diaries throughout their texts. The fact that they are not consistently referred to may imply that the royal diaries were explicitly created to control the narrative of Alexander's final days. Regarding anachronistic errors, the most obvious is the royal diaries mentioning a temple of Serapis in Babylonia. To date, no such temple has been discovered, and the cult of Serapis is often thought to have originated in Ptolemaic Egypt, when Ptolemy I sought to combine the Egyptian god Osiris Espis, who the Greeks referred to as Osirapis, with Greek deities. The very fact that Serapis is mentioned in the royal diaries, when such a god was unknown during Alexander's lifetime, has led some historians, such as Paul Doherty, to conclude that this detail was fabricated proving that the royal diaries were doctored. The fact that Serapis originated in Egypt may, Doherty argues, imply that Ptolemy specifically had a hand in fabricating the diaries. In Doherty's view, if the diaries are a fabrication, the only possible explanation is that they were created to cover up the assassination of Alexander. Moreover, there is also an apparent contradiction in the royal diaries. Both Arian and Plutarch claimed that the diaries record Alexander as having been so weak in his final days that he completely lost his voice, only being able to gesture with his right hand to his soldiers who filed past. Nevertheless, he was apparently able to utter his famous final words of leaving his empire to the strongest. After Alexander's death, his generals would spend decades fighting over the spoils of his empire. It was in all of their best interests for Alexander to have been ambiguous about who his successor would be, and even to justify their wars. It is therefore remarkably convenient that the speechless king managed a few final words to give legitimacy to all of these successors. This again may suggest that the diaries were constructed to cover up a conspiracy against Alexander. Lastly, at no point do the royal diaries ever mention a physician attending Alexander. Alexander's army had good medical knowledge for their time, and several dedicated physicians, including Philip the Doctor, who was likely in Babylon with Alexander. When Hephaestion had fallen ill with a fever, he had been assigned a doctor who had given him medicine, but no such care was recorded for Alexander. Some have suggested that this did not happen because Alexander had the doctor who failed to cure Hephaestion killed, and this intimidated his other medics. However, Alexander was the king and the most powerful man in the known world. Is it truly believable that nobody would have insisted that a doctor at least try to cure him? There are, however, equally strong arguments against these claims. The logic that the intense detail of the diaries suggested that Alexander was assassinated is something of a catch-22. The high level of detail makes its veracity doubtful, but a lack of detail would be just as, if not more, suspicious. Moreover, it is entirely possible that the diaries were intended to control the narrative of Alexander's death, but this does not inherently imply that he was assassinated. The diaries may have been deliberately designed to try and show how Alexander's death by natural causes was irrefutable. Regarding the Temple of Serapis, Bosworth, a leading Alexander historian, has instead suggested that the Babylonian god Bel Marduk may have been misidentified as Osirapis in the royal diaries, both gods sharing similar bull iconography, and that later writers who used the diaries in turn corrected Osirapis to Serapis. 
Others suggest that the name Serapis was confused with Sa'apsi, the title of a Babylonian god. Mistakes and errors in copying such as these are common in ancient works, so either theory is believable. The apparent contradiction between Alexander's last words and his inability to speak is also explainable if we are slightly less pedantic about the wording. It is entirely possible that Alexander was unable to speak for many of his last days, but managed to utter a single word in his dying moments. The absence of any mentioned doctor may be explained as a simple oversight. It is possible that the various baths Alexander took and his movement to cooler rooms were all done on the advice of his doctor, but that this was simply not detailed by the diaries. Those who would say that Alexander was poisoned ultimately rely upon the pamphlet. As discussed earlier, while the Alexander romance, in which this version of events appears, is not usually viewed as an accurate source of information, this particular section is, and modern scholars agree that the pamphlet also dates to shortly after Alexander's death. Arguments in favour of the veracity of the pamphlet are that whoever wrote it appeared to have intimate knowledge of the last days of Alexander, including the names of those who were at the final party he attended, which suggests that it was originally written by an eyewitness. The pamphlet also specifies which officers were involved in the plot, who was not, how the poison was smuggled in, and how Alexander ingested it. All of these details may well speak to its integrity. Once again, the overall claim that Alexander was assassinated is also not outlandish. Regicide was a worryingly common fate for many Macedonian kings, and there were certainly many men who would have benefited from Alexander's death. Antipater in particular, who the pamphlet credits as the mastermind, had apparently been arguing with Alexander's mother, Olympias, and had recently been summoned by Alexander to Babylon, so he may have been fearful of repercussions. Almost the entirety of Alexander's officer corps benefited from his death, many becoming powerful rulers of successor states. Moreover, the death of Clytus, Callisthenes, two mutinies, Persianization, and yet another planned campaign, all may have cost Alexander the loyalty of his companions in the end. Lastly, it is perfectly possible to align Alexander's symptoms in his last days with poisons which we know were available at the time. As with the royal diaries, however, the pamphlet has several questionable details. It is, firstly, highly suspicious that it explicitly names the mastermind behind the alleged assassination, Antipater, as well as all the other guilty parties, and simultaneously explicitly names the generals who were innocent. One cannot help but wonder how the author knew this information. In theory, it could have come from an eyewitness at the party, but the fact that almost all the men in the room would soon end up at war with each other does not inspire confidence in an honest account. It is highly likely, for example, that the author took the opportunity to label themselves as innocent, while also condemning their rivals. The pamphlet also gives an account of Alexander's final will, which borders on being completely incomprehensible. In it, Alexander describes the state of affairs during his lifetime. Craterus is named the regent of Macedonia, Ptolemy the governor of Egypt, and Perdiccas and Antigonus are named governors of Asia. While Craterus may have been appointed as the governor of Macedonia during Alexander's lifetime, Ptolemy had certainly not been made governor of Egypt. That position was held by a man named Cleomenes. Similarly, Antigonus was only the satrap of Phrygia, and we have no record of Perdiccas being a satrap during Alexander's life. These titles, instead, broadly reflect the situation that emerged after Alexander's death, suggesting that the will given by the pamphlet was fabricated to legitimize the claims made by various successors later. Later, the will records who Alexander appoints as the various satraps. They align almost perfectly with the division of his empire made by his generals at the so-called Partition of Babylon. It may be thought, therefore, that Alexander simply named the satraps in his will, and the generals followed his wishes at the partition of Babylon. However, it is highly suspicious that not a single eastern satrap is named. Alexander used many local nobles as his satraps, and spent much of his later life assimilating Persians into his court. 
It is almost inconceivable that he would not have followed a similar policy in his will. The will, instead, seems to reinforce the division of Alexander's empire that his officers decided upon at the partition. One notable difference, however, is that Ptolemy, previously listed as the apparent satrap of Egypt, is instead made satrap of the comparatively poorer province of Libya. All of these factors again suggest that the will was edited, if not completely fabricated. If the will is fabricated, then the reliability of the pamphlet, and so the claim that Alexander was assassinated, becomes highly questionable. Perhaps the most curious aspect of the will is Alexander's naming of a successor. He firstly says that his brother Philip will be king of Macedonia, under the condition that if his own unborn child is a son, he will replace Philip, and that if it is a girl, the Macedonians can choose their own king. He then says that until his child is born, Craterus will rule over Macedonia. Later he gives his ring and his wife to Perdiccas, both of which could be marking him as the successor. Finally, Alexander proclaims that he leaves his kingdom to the strongest. In short, the wording is ambiguous enough that the heir to Alexander could thus be interpreted as either being Philip, Alexander's unborn son, a man chosen by the Macedonians, Perdiccas, or simply the strongest. One cannot help but feel that the will has been deliberately altered in order to obfuscate who Alexander's true heir would be deliberately and to lend legitimacy to those who would later try to claim his legacy. Some modern historians, however, argue that the pamphlet is an accurate record of Alexander's final moments, including the claim that he was poisoned, but that the will should be treated as a separate text that was clearly edited for propaganda purposes. This would bypass many of the questionable aspects of the pamphlet that we have discussed, but the most pertinent one still remains, who wrote it? It may have been authored by one of the officers who was with Alexander in his last days, but if so, how reliable can we consider it as a source when these same officers had so much to gain from demonizing rivals and legitimizing themselves? If it was not written by an eyewitness, then how did they get such detailed information, such as who was with Alexander at the party, and who was innocent or guilty? We are thus faced with a conundrum. Our two main versions of Alexander's death both seem to date soon after his death, and both seem to have been authored by someone with first-hand experience of the events. Both also have serious flaws, which could suggest that they are fabricated or at least heavily edited. Lastly, the aftermath of Alexander's death resulted in a scenario where many of his successors had clear motives for wanting to control the narrative of his death. We are left with two main interpretations. The first is that Alexander died of natural causes, the royal diaries recorded this honestly, but a rumour that he was assassinated was deliberately fabricated by some of his successors and spread through the pamphlet in order to justify their division of his empire and in order to damage political rivals. The second is that Alexander was assassinated by some of his generals, who then created the royal diaries as part of a cover-up but the truth was circulated by an eyewitness in the form of the pamphlet. The question of what killed Alexander the Great is thus one that can never be answered. The sources simply contradict each other too much for us to have any certainty on the topic. Whichever tradition is believed, there is one fact that all agree on. Alexander died on the 11th of June, 323 BC. At the time, Alexander's wife Roxanne was pregnant and he may have already had an illegitimate child, but there was no clear successor to Alexander's empire. Almost immediately after he had passed, his generals began arguing over who should manage the empire until his child was born, and who would govern the specific satraps. These disagreements grew quickly, and within a few short years, Alexander's empire was divided into various successor kingdoms, each ruled by one of Alexander's generals, and all claiming to be the legitimate heir to his legacy. In the ensuing wars, Alexander's entire family, his mother, half-sisters and brother, his wives, and his eventual son by Roxanne, were hunted down and wiped out. All that would remain of Alexander was his legacy and a multitude of unanswered questions. What future campaigns did he have planned? Would there ever have been a point where Alexander stopped his conquests? 
Did he aim to create a blend of Hellenic and Eastern cultures? Did he consider himself a god on earth? These questions and more have puzzled historians for millennia and led to Alexander being one of the most studied and most famous figures in human history. Arian was perhaps correct to say that Alexander would have approved of the timing of his death while he was still young and clothed in glory. Alexander frequently made conscious parallels between himself and his supposed ancestor Achilles, and he did this once again in his death. Homeric heroes were aware that they could not become truly immortal, but were instead driven by the need for glory so that their names might live on, and they become immortal in memory. So it was for Achilles, so it was for Alexander. For millennia after, Alexander became the de facto measure of quality amongst any who claimed to be a military leader, whether it be Hannibal, Caesar or Napoleon. And so he did achieve his own ultimate ambition, eternal memory. Many criticisms can and should be leveled at Alexander, and modern views of Alexander are varied, some positive, others negative. However, whatever judgments are made of Alexander as a man, all can agree that the scale of his accomplishments was truly remarkable. He had defeated Illyrians, Greeks, Persians, Scythians and Indians, conquered hundreds of tribes and cities, taken an army further than any European king before him, spread Hellenic culture across three continents, and ruled the largest empire humanity had yet seen, all before his 33rd birthday. At the time of his death, he was the most powerful man in the world, undefeated on the battlefield and with a legacy that would prove to be immortal. Thanks again to War Thunder for sponsoring this video. Enter PvP for all skill levels in this massive vehicle combat game on PC or consoles, and make sure to grab our large free bonus pack with premium features, get it all via our link down in the description. We have already started working on our Diadoki series and will start releasing it in January. Consider subscribing and pressing the bell button if you don't want to miss more than 10 episodes on the successors of Alexander. These long videos are difficult to make, so consider liking, sharing and commenting. Recently we've started releasing weekly patron and YouTube member exclusive content. Consider joining their ranks via the link in the description or button under the video to watch these weekly videos, learn about our schedule, get early access to our videos, access our private discord and much more. This is the Kings and Generals channel and we will catch you on the next one.